in the meeting. Okay, we're recording. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening. It is December 4th, 2023, and this is a regular meeting of the town council. The open meeting law was extended and allows us to continue holding meetings where a quorum of the council can either be physically present in the room and or on Zoom. And tonight thus far, we already have uh, nine counselors in the town room and at this point two on Zoom, we're actually three. Uh, we are, are asked, however, with that new law to make adequate uh, accommodations so that all people can attend the meeting either by Zoom in being in the room and or watching TV, live stream, or in, on Amherst Media or by phone. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the December 4, 2023 town meeting, uh, town council meeting to order at 6.35. I'm going to call on councilors by name. At that time, please answer that you are present. That makes sure we can hear you and you can hear us. And then make sure you mute your mic again. Shalini Baumil. I am present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Thank you. Uh, Michelle Miller. Present. Did you? I'm sorry. Present. <laughs> Michelle, we, we can't, can't hear Michelle, you. Michelle, we can't hear you. Oh, oh. I can. I'm going to go on, but come back to you for a mic check in a moment, okay? Uh, Dorothy Pam. Here. I said here. Athena, I'm hearing that folks on Zoom can hear the remote attendees, but we cannot in the room. Yeah. Okay, Dorothy, you can't hear us. Uh, no, I can. Yes, can I can. We can't hear you. Right. Yeah. Okay, hold on. We're seeing what we have to do to fix that. Dorothy, can you hear us now? Can can you test? Yes, I can hear you oh, now. Terrific. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Couldn't hear you okay. before. You just couldn't hear me. Right. <laughs> thank you. So, Anika, you are here. Michelle Miller, can you hear us? And we can hear you. Yes. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes thank really you, loud. Dorothy Pam. Here. Thank you, Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. Alicia Walker. Present. All 13 counselors are present in the meeting. There is no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know. Clearly, Athena is in charge of technical issues. Um, and if we have technical issues, we'll decide at the time how to address those. There is only one public comment period at this meeting tonight. Uh, the agenda includes an executive session for the purpose of discussing the town manager's compensation based on his evaluation. It is our intention at this time to return to the regular meeting at the conclusion of the executive session and to have a motion and vote relevant to any recommendations coming from that executive session. With that, we're going to move to the announcements. And while you're looking at the board, where the announcements are of upcoming committee meetings. I also want to note that the town, new town council will convene on January 2nd at 630. The plan at this point is that we will be in the bang center and we are going to be inviting all other re recently elected officials to join us and be sworn in that night. We're going to try to make it a little bit more than we did during COVID two years ago. So if you're here, that's great. If you aren't able to be here, don't worry about it. You can be sworn in by the clerk. Um, in addition to that, we have several other committee meetings. And as, before I finish announcements, I wanna go on to particularly recognize two town councilors that have been honored just in this last week. The first is Anika Lopes. She was voted one of the indigenous leaders
of Massachusetts, chosen by Mass Live readers, motivated by her grandfather Dudley Bridges, restoration of the Civil War's tablets that are presently in the Bank Center, that shed light on the significant contributions of Black and Indigenous soldiers. In her own words, she says, I approach historical work with a storyteller's heart. Cultivate, cultivate meaning, connect, meaningful connections, be adaptive to change and harshness for skills, diverse skills to weave a narrative that empowers and uplifts communities. The second is Michelle Miller. Michelle was recognized by the Na National African American Reparations Commission, NAARC, and Robin Rue Simons, First Repair, for her work advancing reparations now through the African Heritage Reparation Assembly in Amherst, Mass. At the third symposium, she was among 300, 200 attendees representing more than 75 initiatives, and Amherst was held up as inspirational to and generative of the spread of reparation. Her vision and leadership as an elected official in Amherst was genuinely honored and appreciated. I wanna point out that you can read more about both of these in the front page of the town manager's report and on upcoming announcements on our website. Thank you. We have no hearing tonight, uh, but we do have general public comment. So I want to point out that I am going to estimate at this point there are somewhere between 30 and 40 people in the town room in addition to the counselors that are here. And there are 56 people on Zoom. So I'm going to ask something just a little unusual. And that is, Athena, how many people have signed up to speak in the town room? 20. Okay. And if you are on Zoom, I'm asking you to raise your hand now if you plan to speak. <clears throat> I'm asking that if you plan to speak at any point, you raise your hand now if you are on Zoom. And that is true for the audience. I just need to get an accurate count. There are 12 people who have raised their hands to speak on Zoom and 20. Um, with reluctance, I'm going to ask that you keep your remarks to two minutes. It's not something we like to do, but that means a full hour will be spent on public comment, uh, which is fine. Uh, residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes, two minutes in this case. The committee will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. So with that, Athena, we're going to start with the audience. And let me just explain. When you come up, please state your name, where you live, the street is fine, the district is fine. And then go ahead and make sure you're speaking into the mic and that the green light is on. You'll come up to this desk if you're in the room if you're in on Zoom, you'll be let in. Again, at this point, there are 10 people in the audience in on Zoom that have raised their hands, and I'm going to stick with that number, okay? So, Athena? Catherine Appy, please come up to the microphone, state your name and address before you make your public comment. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Catherine Oppie of Redgate Lane. Um, and I am here to ask that I and tell the town council that I fully support the town council voting to authorize the bonding of additional funds to meet the requirements of MBLC so that the Jones Library renovation and expansion project can proceed. This vote will not raise the amount of money, $15.8 million, previously committed by the town and voted. Community members voted by an overwhelming majority in support of this project. Voting to do nothing is not an option. The many necessary repairs the library requires would cost the town more 
than this well-planned renovation and expansion and would not meet our very important townwide climate goals. Thank you all for your very hard work on behalf of our community. Thank you for joining us. We'll go to the Zoom and it's Neil Immerman. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Um, hello, can, can you hear me? We can. Oh, great. Um, my name is Neil Immerman. I live um, 37 Hillcrest Place in Amherst. And I just wanted to say, um, echoing what Catherine Appi just said, that I'm, I've lived in Amherst 32 years. I, I, my wife and I and our kids very much enjoyed and made use of Jones Library. We're very supportive of the, re the planned renovations and we hope the town board will um will vote to to support and continue this renovation. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Next in the town room. Anna Harrington, please come up and state your name and address before you make your comment. Ann Harrington, 72 Van Meter Drive uh, in Amherst, and I'm a patron of the Jones Library. I'm here to urge you to authorize amending the borrowing cap for the, the renovation and expansion. I think that to defer that decision or to deny the increase would put the whole project at risk. I understand the concern that's been expressed that doing so might jeopardize moving forward with the DPW and fire station projects but those concerns have been addressed to the satisfaction of the finance committee, and it seems it will not. What is harder to understand are other objections, some of which at best are misinformation. For instance, it's been claimed that some of the responsible changes that have been made in the building designed to cut costs are jeopardizing the sustainability measures and the preservation of historical features of the building, which is not true. It's been alleged that the new building will be an oversized colossus, but if that were the case, the Mass Library Board of Commissioners would never have approved the design and certainly wouldn't have awarded the sizable grant that they did. Furthermore, it has been suggested that if the entire project were scrapped, that the donations already received could be redirected to necessary repairs on the existing building. My spouse and I are donors, and we definitely do not want our donation put toward patching up the existing building. And not incidentally, those repairs would cost the town more than what the town has budgeted for the renovation and expansion. The Jones Capital Campaign Committee is doing an excellent job of reaching its goals through the donations and the grants that it's been succeeded in receiving. And the Jones trustees in the town have executed legally binding commitments that ensure that the town's financial obligation will not exceed what has already been budgeted. In short, it's time to move forward with this project that over 60% of town voters have supported. So I ask you now to support amending the borrowing cap so as not to jeopardize the renovation and expansion. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. We're going now to um, the Zoom. Ellen Boucher, please enter the room and state your name. I'm sorry if I mispronounced it. That's fine. Um, my name is Ellen Boucher and I live okay. on Lime Lane in Amherst. Um, thank you all for the work that you do for our town. I'd like to strongly encourage you to vote in favor of amending the borrowing cap for the Jones Library. My family and I are heavy users of the library, especially the children's room, which very much needs updating. Um, but to my mind, the crucial point is that town residents have already voted in favor of the library renovations. And as has been said, amending the borrowing cap won't increase the project's cost to the town. So if the council fails to vote in favor of raising the borrowing authorization, they will be effectively overruling the 65% of residents who voted in favor of this project. So to sum up, um, Amherst residents voted for this project and the council should see it through, especially since the costs to the town haven't changed. If not, then what was the point of having the public vote in favor of this project in the first place? Thank you very much. Thank you. 
you know. Next is Christine Plett. Please uh, correct your name pronunciation if I got it wrong and state your address before you begin. Christine Pleat, 72 Van Meter Drive. I'll be very short because everybody's already said what I was gonna say. Um, I am very much in favor of the council voting to amend the borrowing cap. Um, thus far, 38.7 million has been raised from all sources more than 84% of the estimated cost of $46.1 million. And the fundraising continues. The library renovation received overwhelming support from the town in last year's referendum. And the monies raised thus far are a testament to that commitment. Please vote yes to amend the borrowing cap and let this project move forward. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Erica Zikos, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Thank you, uh, Eric Zikas, District 5, uh, Holst Road. Joining the chorus tonight, um, our library has a plan and has been raising funds and is on track to fully fund this project costs. Approving the bonding for an increased borrowing cap for the library won't impact plans for any other capital projects in the queue. Our new library is a fiscally, equitably, historically, and environmentally responsible design that the town of Amherst both needs and wants. The only way that the town will pay is if we don't do the renovation, bringing the building up to code, repairing damage that all comes at a cost. These things are part of the renovation and addition design. They're baked into the plan to provide us a 21st century community hub, one that serves our children and teens, our English language learners, our differently abled, and everybody else. <laughs> the town needs to honor the will of the constituents, the overwhelming majority of voters who really wanna see this project library project move forward. Thanks. Thank you. Going back to the room. Carol Johnson, please come up and state your name and address before you make your comment. Yes, uh, my name is Carol Johnson. I was part of the group that raised money for and built the Amherst Cinema. And I was the executive director of the cinema for 13 years until my retirement a couple of years ago. I'm here to say two things. First of all, this is a really important project. And second of all, fundraising is going well. It's important because the library is a community room open to everyone. Children, people of a certain age with hair my color, <laughs> and all in between. Uh, people who are new to town, people who've lived here for many years, we've lived here 25 years, actually longer than that, and we raised our daughters here. It is a place where people can come who don't have computers at home. It is really a, a community living room, and it's a place where our goals of social justice and uh, equality of opportunity can be made available to many, many people. So it's important. I know we have other important projects uh, before us as a town, but there's nothing that is more important than a town library. Um, second of all, the fundraising is going well. I am. I have uh, joined the uh, Friends of the Jones, which is the body that is raising money for this project. And I'm very happy to say that I'm working with some people who are very competent and experienced and the project is going well. So I hope that you as a town council will vote to amend the borrowing cap and support this project going forward. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. On Zoom, Tony Cunningham, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Thank you, Tony Cunningham Owen Drive. I was watching The Crown last night and Prince Charles and Camilla were hiring a spin doctor to repair their image. It made me think of the campaign around this library bond vote, filled with exaggeration and mistruths to exert pressure on councillors to approve the borrowing. The amount of spin going on is dizzying. 
What you have been given to secure an affirmative vote is the best case scenario for plan A, the renovation expansion, and the worst case scenario for plan B. For plan A, you have a fancy full cash flow that the trustees and some of you already know is not achievable. It shows the library giving the town $2 million in less than two months time, then 4 million in early 25, 5 million in early 26, and a balance of 2.3 million in July, 2026. Yet there's nothing that obligates the library to meet this schedule and no consequences when they inevitably can't. The cash flow is omitted from the latest memorandum of agreement. On the flip side, you've been provided a worst case scenario for plan B, a false contention that the town would be responsible for everything, an inflated repairs package with no electrification, no value engineering, no CPA or other funding. The goal here has clearly been to make the alternative look so bad that it would be crazy to choose it. To take your fiduciary duty seriously before voting, and I know some of you have tried, you would need to insist on, at the very least, cash flows for a worst case scenario for plan A and a best case scenario for plan B. The impact each would have on the 10 year capital plan and on reserves and on the timeline for the fire station and DPW. As far as I can tell, the newly amended MOA presented to you tonight does nothing to reduce the risk to the town and in fact likely makes it worse. It puts in black and white that the library share is not due until June 2027 in direct contradiction to the cash flow that shows the library paying the remainder a year earlier. The MOA limits the library share to a dollar amount rather than stating that it is the remainder after deducting the towns and state shares from the actual cost. We do not know that the actual cost will be 46.1 million. And it does not require the library to pay interest on the short-term borrowing, to e to wrap even up. committing that the library share will not increase. Thank you. Considering all of the critical information- Tony, we need you to finish. Thank you. Thank you. That is what I will do to anybody that goes over two minutes, just to be clear. Janice Lefebvre. Is make sure the green light is on. Please. There you go. Thank you. Um, I would just like to tell the town council that my husband and I uh, support this project. We supported it with our vote. We support it with our donation that we have made over uh, a five-year period. Um, I don't know what other people uh, plan to do or can't speak for anyone else, but if the council votes to authorize the town uh, to borrow the full amount, we are willing to make our full donation at this time to help silence any possible concerns about fundraising. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Bill, we're, we're Lee. <laughs> Again, please enter the room, state your name and where you live, and please correct my pronunciation of your name. Good evening. Thank you for your time. My name is Bill Worley. Can you hear me? We can. And I didn't see the timer going. Um, and I'm <clears throat> here to support, uh, I live in South Amherst on Carriage Lane. I'm here to support the um, amending the borrowing cap. Uh, I appreciate all the um, comments that have already been made. This is a financially responsible decision, a vibrant, vibrant library is a beacon in a community such as ours and supports all of the community, uh, all ages and interests, and it uh, provides a, a, a place for a community uh, center and a place for people to gather um, that is not available in any other area in town. So uh, thank you for your efforts and uh, again, support uh, amending the borrowing cap. Thank you for joining us. Back to the audience. Nancy Campbell, please come up. Hello. Um, Nancy Campbell, 369 Middle Street. Delay, delay, delay. How often do we hear this repetition? In the context is never good. How many millions has delay, delay, delay cost the town of Amherst in recent years? 
elementary schools, double the price. Delays in deciding to renovate, expand the Jones Library, already maybe $10 million in additional costs, maybe more. I urge the town council, please don't add another delay to our list of delays. This is a quote from 1890 that appeared in the Amherst Record newspaper. Quote, we should bear in mind the fact that the architect of the Cathedral of Milan, backed by the wealth of the universe, could not have designed a village horse shed that would meet the universal favor <laughs> at the hands of the citizens of Amherst. <laughs> This was written about the controversial decision to build this town hall where we sit tonight, 133 years ago. I think they made the right decision. Thank you. Thank you. Always helps to have a little levity. Um, Gretchen Plotkin, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Um, I live at 11 Baldwin Lane in South Amherst. Um, <clears throat> I urge you to increase the borrowing cap needed so the renovation and expansion can be undertaken for the Jones Library. Um, as other people have stated ahead of me, we are well on our way to meeting community goals for fundraising, which is, in my mind, a very important indicator of community support. Not increasing the cap will forfeit over $23 million and the project will not continue. Um, I and the majority of Amherst residents support this project. We, I ask you to vote um, to increase the borrowing cap um, and I thank you for your work on this. Thank you. Dale Peterson is next. Dale Peterson, 234 Lincoln Avenue, presently District 3, soon to be District 4. Uh, I find myself optimistic in believing that the council will actually vote the amendment to lift the cap on the debt and will agree to fully fund the Jones Library Project to its completion. I do so because I find it impossible not to remember that the town council took form in large part in response to town meetings failure to ex execute uh, a, the will of Amherst voters to construct and fund an elementary school. We know what the unfortunate consequences were of that delay. What I want to speak of tonight is not simply the cost of litigation and delay uh, uh, for the final project. I want to talk about the cost of delay for the excellent workforce and students the teachers, the paraprofessionals, and the students who had to endure for a number of years facilities which were unhealthy and dysfunctional. And the same situation exists with the Jones Library. Uh, the 64% of Amherst voters supported a project to renovate and expand the Jones Library. I think that some members of the opposition we need you to wrap have up. focused upon the expansion, thinking that it was grandiose. Please wrap up. Thank you. Uh, 
What I want to say about that is that I don't believe they've actually visited the library. I need you to say. If they have, as I have, it is one Thank of the you. most cramped spaces possible. I, I need you to. to I have answer. I have been in the Soviet Union and been in the provinces Thank and you. gone to a special collections, which was better, better accommodated. Thank you. I think the point is made. Thank you. Thank you. I I really beg the rest of you to stick to your time frame. Thank you. Uh, Jenny Riley, please enter the room. State your name and where you live. All right, good evening. I'm Jennifer Riley of 36 Pondview Drive. And this is my first town council meeting. Um, and as an Amherst taxpayer and the parent of a fifth grader in our public schools, and as a person who's often enjoyed the Jones Library uh, in the seven plus years that we've lived here, uh, I'm just submitting this comment tonight to urge the town council to take all necessary steps to continue the Jones Library renovation and expansion project. Um, a yes vote tonight to amend the borrowing cap. It feels important to demonstrate to government sources of funding, also to private donors, and perhaps most importantly, to the people and families of Amherst, that the town council is going to steward this project forward and get it across the finish line. So thank you for all you're doing to make that happen. Uh, and, and thank you for keeping us on the road to a Jones Library that will truly meet the needs of our town. Thank you for joining us. Jeff Lee. Jeff Lee from, I live on Southeast Street. Uh, some history. In 2014-15, two fundraisers, Kent Ferber and Matt Blumenfeld, pitched to the trustees the idea of pursuing an MBLC library construction grant. So far, so good. The MBLC requires that the library's long range plan support any grant application. So the fundraisers and trustees came up with a five year plan claiming that a community the size of Amherst, Amherst needs an 87,000 square foot building. This number would have Amherst with its 17,000 full time residents build the fifth largest library in Massachusetts after Boston, Worcester, Cambridge, and Newton. This encouraged a large chunk of grant money, but also required a large commitment of taxpayer funds from the town and a large fundraising commitment. In 2018, with funding approval coming up, four library fundraisers helped co-found the PAC Amherst Forward. Fundraisers come with a large with large contact lists and social media networks, as well as access to people who will donate money to the PAC and lobby for the library project, whether it's cost justified or not. In subsequent town meeting elections, or sub town council elections, Amherst Ford has succeeded in helping many of you get elected. Last week, we learned that uh, capital campaign fundraisers intend to pay 1.05 million in campaign expenses. With personnel expenses representing 90% of campaign expenses, Amherst Forward Library professional fundraisers stand to earn more than 900,000 for their li lobbying efforts. If this isn't a conflict of interest and a perversion of our local democracy, I don't know what is. Please do the right thing. Vote no and find a more affordable and democratic way to fix up the Jones Library. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We'll go to Maria Kapecki. Please, Kapicki, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Maria Kapicki, South Amherst. Back in April of this year, when the town council voted to authorize borrowing for the elementary school project, there was much wringing of hands over committing $5 million of capital reserves to lower the borrowing and therefore the tax impact on residents. Councilors reluctantly agreed only when promised that most of that money would be replenished through federal and utility rebates. An effort by Councilor Walker to dedicate another $5 million to decrease the burden on taxpayers further was not supported, with councilors exclaiming that these funds were needed to pay for the fire station. Now those same councilors are singing a very different tune. For the first time at a public meeting last week, Council President Lynn Griesmer, Finance Committee Chair Andy Steinberg, and Town Manager Paul Bockelman all suggested spending those same capital reserves that just a few months ago were not to be touched to relieve pressure from the high cost of the library project. Gone is the promise to save those funds for the fire station. They have finally said out loud what we have long suspected, 
When the debt from the library project drains the capital budget, they are perfectly content to tap into the reserves to cover the shortfall, and the fire station can just keep on waiting. Despite being asked multiple times, Bachelman has still not produced details of the impact of taking on this debt on annual capital spending, on the immense backlog of road and sidewalk repairs, or on the timeline for replacing the DPW and fire station. The fiscal model that was created to understand how the quote four capital projects affect each other and other capital needs remains withheld from the council and the public. It's been long clear that there is nothing that several members of this body could learn that would lead them to vote no on the library project. They don't want to hear about the downsides. Their lack of critical questioning makes it clear that it really doesn't matter to them how much it costs, how much risk it entails, or what impacts it would have on other town needs. They want this library project no matter what. I urge you to act in the best interest of the town as a whole and not push essential public safety to the back of the line. Thank you for joining us. Cami McGovern? Governor, please correct my pronunciation of your name. Hi, my name is Cami McGovern and I'm on Memorial Drive in Amherst. And I am speaking to you as a children's book author who has traveled pretty extensively through the state of Massachusetts and has seen in schools and li what libraries are capable of when they have well-funded, adequate teen rooms and children ro children's rooms. And um, what you see in, not surprisingly, Brookline, Cambridge, Wellesley, and well-funded towns like that are teen rooms that have incredible programming and statistics to bear out how their programming for teenagers impacts anti-drug, um, uh, mental health, graduation rates, um, the, the support for the teens that so often fall between the cracks. And what I would say is it's not just happening in those towns. If we go to, I would, I would actually beg of the counselors to visit South Hadley or Sunderland to see what a separate teen room provides for the teens that are there. When you have a door you can shut, you have teens empowered to create their own programming that in which they can take care of themselves, talk to each other, form bonds. And it, I have participated in programmings with both of those towns and it's extraordinary to see. Jones could do all of that. They only need the space. They currently have two beanbag chairs for a teen space, which is not adequate. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Todd Holland, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Todd Holland, I live on Elf Hill Road in South Amherst, District 5. Can you all hear me? We can. I participated with others on the Sustainability Committee for the Jones Library, so I'm pretty familiar with the project. And I'd also like to say that I have about 40 years experience in commercial construction. And right now I have never been more frustrated or anxious about the art and science of cost estimation for projects. I have two projects going to bid. One of them will be announced on Wednesday. And I have had to do a very similar effort of value engineering and scaling back of scope of that project to make it meet the estimated budget. And I can I was thrilled to hear someone else say that the effort to do that at the Jones Library did not violate any sustainability principles or jeopardize the functioning and beauty and efficiency of the building. What I will say is you have to trust the process. You have a very good design team. You will not know how much this is gonna cost until it goes to bid. You can't get around that. If you choose to not secure the funding and bid anyway, it will be met with uncertainty, maybe disinterest in the bidding process, and all that will translate to increased costs. I really think things are turning around. There are projects that have had competitive bids lately, and I will just urge you to approve this 
It's a beautiful project and a beautiful library. And I think we owe it to the people of Amherst to approve and move forward with it. Thank you for joining us. Back to the room. Lou Conover, please come up. Lou Conover, uh, 120 Pulpit Hill Road. I love the Jones Library. I use the Jones Library all the time. It's um, it's one of the things that makes Amherst a great place. And this project has been put forward and supported by a political party in our town government. Now, I know that most of you were endorsed by that political party, but not all of you. I would be pleasantly surprised if anyone who uh, was endorsed by Amherst Forward would actually take an honest look at this project. I'm, I tend to doubt it, but it would please me. So really I'm talking to the five of you that were not endorsed, that are not a member of this political party. I see a great risk here. The, the fact is that the, the funding, the discussion, the finances and all of this has been completely confused and obfuscated. Uh, it, I, I've listened in a few times and it's almost impossible for me to follow what's going on. At a minimum, it hasn't been put forward in uh, plain, the plain language that the citizens of the town can understand. Um, and it especially has not been fo put forward in that plain language, how the, what effect it's going to have on the less wealthy members of the town. So I would urge all of you, and especially urge the five of you that are not members of this political party to put common sense before politics and vote against the increased borrowing. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Nancy Ratner, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Uh, my name is Nancy Ratner. I live uh, 199 Lincoln Avenue and I've long been a supporter of this project. I'm speaking just to urge you to Approve the bond authorization. Nothing in the project has changed that should change that decision. I think that Jones is a jewel in this town. It's there, it's been special for people for a long time and it will continue to be if we have this project go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheryl Zoll, please come up. My name is, is Cheryl Zoll. I live on Cosby Avenue in Amherst. Um, I want to thank the council for the care that you're taking with this process. Um, I'm here to support amending, lifting the cap, and I'm speaking as someone who's done a capital campaign in Amherst. Um, I was the director of the Amherst Survival Center in the early 2000s when we did a capital campaign, and that was an organization with a very tiny budget and no history of fundraising serving incredible needs of the town. And we managed to raise five times our annual budget because the people of Amherst actually really care. And when they saw what the need was and what we could do with a new building, they came forward and we were able to build the new building. I see the Jones Library as, as essential to the Amherst community as the Amherst Survival Center. I spent a lot of time at the library myself. And when I was there, I often referred to it as survival center self because I would see survival center participants there reading books, accessing the internet, looking for jobs, sometimes offering tutoring, sometimes getting, getting tutoring, getting resources for their kids and so on. All the things that happen in the library in a space that when I toured it, I, reminded me so much of the old survival center in the basement. The people who are working there are heroic to be doing what they're doing under those conditions. So, um, so and, and as somebody who has done a campaign and seen the way in which people in this community support this community, I have every confidence in the 
the campaign that's going on now for the library, over 84% of the total has already been raised. And we didn't know what we were doing and we were able to do our capital campaign. And this committee really knows what it's doing. And I've been watching and participating where I can. Um, so I just wanted to say from that perspective, if there is concern about the campaign, the experience that I have doing a campaign in this community gives me every confidence that we're, we'll meet the goals. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Letitia LaFollette, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. I'm Letitia LaFollette. I live at 18 Dana Street. You can hear me now. Yes, I can see it. Yes. yes. Thank you. I'm in District 3. Um, and <clears throat> It is my pleasure to vote to urge you to vote in support of the Jones Library renovation and to increase the total amount um, borrowed to be borrowed. Um, I'd like to stress again that the town's the town's share will not change. We've heard otherwise here. Um, I see supporting the vision for the 21st century library as critical to the future of Amherst as an inclusive community. Um, it will also serve as an important economic driver as you have heard from the bid and small business owners in town. Um, I have participated in the community capital campaign fundraising. I have been extremely impressed by the work that they have done. I would like to echo what um, Cheryl Zolt just said about the fundraising. And I would be dismayed to see the millions of dollars that have been awarded to the project in grants like the NEH one, the largest one awarded a library in this country and gifts like that of Amherst College to be turned away um, if the town council could not muster a two thirds majority in favor of raising the borrowing limit. Um, uh, and I would like to also just be on the record saying that the plan B that several people, other speakers have referred to is not actually a plan. It was rejected by the library years ago and is a fiction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Susan Tracy, please come on up. Hello, my name is Susan Tracy from 15 Hopbrook Road in Amherst. Um, I originally supported the library plan because as a historian, I saw that it would safeguard our town documents and papers. And then last spring, there was a flood so that faith was fully uh, realized in, in this new plan. I also supported the original plan because it was accessible for differently abled people and for the English as a second language uh, teacher teaching program, uh, which needs to be uh, taken out of its closet. And I'm always in favor of people coming out of the closet. So, <laughs> Um, and now, and now the uh, Civil War tablets commemorating the African American members of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment from Amherst who fought here are, are going to be in our library. So I think that's really, really exciting, and it will be a way of bringing that history into the public sphere. Um, so I'm totally in favor of amending the borrowing cap uh, that the Massachusetts Board of Library Commission commissioners requires. One of the more exciting aspects of this project is the federal grant, which someone just mentioned was the largest federal grant offered uh, for any uh, library in any town in the country. And I think that's something to really, really be proud of. And it really um, excites me when I think that uh, Jones Library had been rec recognized for its excellence and the commitment of the town. So thank you very much for your past support and I hope you will support it again tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rudy Perkins, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Hi, Rudy Perkins, uh, 42 Cherry Lane in Amherst. Can you hear me all right? We can. Excellent, thanks. Um, I just wanted to, I, I'm not gonna comment which way you should vote, but if you do vote, in favor of raising the cap. I think you still need to make some changes to the second amendment to the MOA in order to protect the town's financial interest going forward. Um, the fact sheet that was put out December 2nd says that the tr uh, trustees and the town manager have signed binding agreements that any cost beyond the mass 
Board of Library Commissioners, MBLC, and town uh, commitments are the responsibilities of the trustees. Bravo, but that language is not in the MOA or the Second Amendment. So I think you need to get that language into the amendment so that it's very clear that if there are further cost increases, those are not going to be the responsibility of the town. They're going to be the responsibility of the library. And as I suggested and others did, we're actually fronting the money uh, potentially while the library gets donations before they transfer the funds in. And uh, the thought came up, uh, I think at your last meeting, that you should charge the any ban interest that we have to pay to cover that should be covered by the library. That's only fair. This is They've made the commitment to contribute a certain amount into this project, and it, it has to be put in in a timely way. And if it isn't, and we have to borrow to cover it, they should pick up the interest tab on that. I think you should attach the cash flow plan as a schedule to the MOA so that everybody knows the commitment and that will help define what interest payments are being made covering the um, tardy payments into the project. And finally, you should have a mortgage so that you have an enforcement mechanism for payments owed. So uh, if you go ahead, please make those changes or something. You need to wrap up, please. Um, Rebecca Nordstrom. Hi, my name is Rebecca Nordstrom and I live on 39 Dana Street, um, District 3. And um, I'm here to support uh, wholeheartedly the library uh, renovation and expansion project. Um, I uh, also want to express great appreciation to the library trustees, the staff, all the people who have been working on this project tirelessly for years now. Uh, and I think they've done a fantastic job of sharing their process with us along the way. And I've seen the plans and I've gone to meetings and I've heard about them and I'm just, I'm just incredibly impressed with what, um, what they have planned. And I really hope that you will uh, vote to amend the cap so that they'll be able to move ahead with this for all the reasons that all the other people before me have stated. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, next. Um, okay, Jana Keller, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Janet, you need to unmute. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm asking you to vote no for raising the library project borrowing cap um, for the 9, 8, 9 .8 million supplemental appropriation, bringing the total authorization to the project for to 46 million one. This project is not the highest priority in town. Please consider pressing on address needs like repairing pothole fill streets and unsafe sidewalks, completing the new school, building a new fire station and the DPW building, investing in net zero upgrades in town buildings, including the library to reduce energy costs and avert damage from climate change impacts like the flooding we had this summer. Please say no. Thanks. Thank you. Deb Leonard, please come on up. Hi, my name is Deb Leonard. I live on um, Old Farm Road, and I'm here to encourage you to vote yes to uh, raise the borrowing, borrowing cap. I would like to say that a no vote, to be absolutely clear, is not a pause. It's not a vote for the roads. It's not a vote for the B DPW building. It's not a vote for the fire station. It's not a vote for lower taxes. It's not a vote for democracy. 
It's not a vote for fiscal responsibility, whereas a yes vote is a vote to support the wishes of the voters. It support the um, compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's to support a free place for teens to go in town without having to drop money on bubble tea. It's a, it's a, a vote to support a building that better supports English language learners, those without high speed internet at home, and our goals of environmental sustainability. In sum, it's a vote to support the values of our community. Um, it's been said that if you want to see where our community's values lie, look at the money. So let's put our money where our mouths are. I, I would like to say on a personal note, I drive a uh, 20 year old beat up minivan. So I'm not big on spending money. Um, I like to stretch my dollars just like everyone else does. Um, my minivan supports my needs. It does what I need it to do. People suggest perhaps that it's time to reinvest. And I would if that minivan better supported the needs of my family, myself, my safety. This, um, this new library, this expanded library, this renovated library, will better support the needs of our community and reflect our values. Thank you. Thank you. The last person that is on Zoom and the last person I'll call on from Zoom is John. Please enter the room, state your name and where you live. We cannot hear you and you need to state your full name. Um, can you? Yes, now we can hear you. No, we can't. Now you mute it. No, you need to unmute and stay unmuted. I just want to mention that I made the last call for Zoom in the audience. Oh, uh, can you hear me now? We can. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, this is John from Cherry Lane. I have a concern uh, for the rental uh, property uh, by law proposal. Uh, in that proposal, there is a magic number of 25. So uh, the landlord with uh, 25 or more um, properties or landlord with less than 25 properties, they, are, they have different treatment. So with a, for landlord with less than 25 properties, all his or her property will be inspected 100% within five year period. For uh, a landlord with more than 25, let's say 100, potentially only 20% of the property will be inspected every uh, five years. So this creates two tiers of citizens in the town, two tiers of landlord and two tiers of tenants. So for the tenants who happen to uh, rent from uh, you know, mom and pop landlord, he will subject to inspections every five years. If uh, a tenant happened to rent from uh, like a, a huge uh, apartment complex, he or she, the tenant will only subject to such like 20% of the chance or maybe a definite chance, but only 20 years will have an inspection. So this is, I, I feel like this has a, like a, uh, an unjust duty I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, unjust uh, burden on the mom and pop uh, landlord. Uh, and then, uh, you know, people in this town will be treated differently, you know, for the landlord, two tiers of landlord, for tenants, two tiers of land, uh, tenants. So I feel this is a, a need to be, you know, warrant uh, some kind of consideration uh, on the bylaw. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to only take comments from those people who are in the room from now on. Tom Crossman. I can't hear you. Okay. Uh, Rob Kusner. I've been sitting so long, must I? Yes. <laughs> I'd rather just stand for a minute. 
I'm sorry, we only have two minutes, and I just want to say the last speaker, who was obviously not on the topic of the library, I, I hope you will think about that also. So now I'd like to talk about the library. Um, I've been in town now for nearly 35 years. I think this is my 36th year in town with some absences. And uh, I spent three of those years in this room quite a bit, serving like you, uh, the public, I hope. And uh, during that time, I served also the Joint Capital Planning Committee when the library that I love quite a bit, in fact, I, I borrowed a book from a library, but this is from a little library rather than Jones, the one I'm reading now, Empire Falls, think about the title. Um, the Jones Library is a library that I consider as a, as a space and it's also as a historical structure. The space I can see from the testimony tonight needs to be improved. And I think we all agree on that. And then the story that you then have to face is, is it going to be an improvement that's sensitive to the historical structure or to the current needs of the town? And that's where I think a lot of the tension is happening. There's also the financial tension, which I'm hearing from many of the folks here. And many of us can afford the small tax increase that'll in your to our benefits, hopefully at some point in improving the space, but some of us won't. And none of us will ever be able to regain the historical structure that exists there now. So I'm asking all of you, all 13 of you who have the opportunity to vote on this and the whatever number of you are supported by whichever party to think very carefully before you cast a vote either tonight or the next few meetings that you have about the kind of commitment you're making to both the historical space, which will not be preserved. In fact, it will be demolished. Let's use English, not new speak. It'll be demolished and replaced by something modern. Maybe it'll be something beautiful. I'm excited to think of the beauty that could replace the present beauty, but I'm not convinced that'll happen. But tonight, you have a job to think carefully before acting. And I think you've heard advice from both sides about how to think more carefully about whether to go forward tonight. Take some time to think about it. Thank you. Vince O'Connor. Vince O'Connor, 175 Summer Street. Uh, first, uh, there has been no public hearing on the the um, inspection issue, um, and I have made it clear to some of the landlords in town that I will become a plaintiff to sue the town uh, regarding any passage of this article. I think it is very premature and a very potentially destructive project to families. With regard to the library, it's a bad project. It will result in a sterile mausoleum replacing a historic structure. And it is not the project that the voters approved. As a 40 year, 40 plus year town meeting member, I believe that the vote that the town meeting took, which resulted in its departure from the political realm, was an entirely worthwhile vote because it saved the school children of this town another 50 years of a bad school, similar to the Fort River School, which was protested by the Wildwood parents and built anyway over their objections. That was a bad project. It was a bad organizational structure for the schools, and it was worth de um, de sacrificing the town meeting to get rid of that project and replace it with something which I think we can believe in. Second, I am appalled by the fact of how much the fundraisers are going to profit from this activity, and every member of this council should be appalled. You need to wrap up, Vince. We're yeah. restricted to two minutes today. Finally, 
with regard to Amherst College and their thing. Vince, who, who pledged now. what to the Amherst College president in return for what? Oh, and to Vince, give a million dollars your to a is project up. that is insult to the parent of every child in the public schools of this town. Thank you. James Offrio. Hi, um, my name's James Ofria. This is my first um, town council meeting. I live in the Colonial Village Apartments in Amherst. I am not familiar with all of the things in the new proposed rental bylaw uh, proposal, but I do believe that landlords should be held accountable for the conditions of their properties to the fullest extent and that all of the properties in Amherst should be more affordable for newer generations of tenants. And I'm going to be doing more research on this bylaw in my free time because I'm very curious about it. Um, I am in support of increasing the borrowing cap for the Jones Library expansion and renovation. I am a queer, disabled, poor, transgender UMass Amherst student. I am from a generation of students that is uniquely disillusioned by a national political landscape that refuses to invest in marginalized members of our society. I personally don't really care how much money the library gets, um, although the borrowing cap increase would be incredibly beneficial to everyone who lives here. I believe Amherst has the moral and ethical duty to invest in public infrastructure, and in doing so, invest in all its broke college students, all its unhoused, and all its previously incarcerated residents. Everyone in this town deserves equitable access to learning and recreation in a safe community-based setting. I find the idea that we cannot have a better library because of other infrastructure needs to be an unimaginative political stance. The free resources of the Jones Library are essential for my ability to access research texts post-graduation and to participate in local community gatherings that do not revolve around loud nightlife. This library facilitates access to a love of learning that will follow me as long as I live. I deserve a beautiful, necessary, expansive library. I deserve a safe and clean library. We all do. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Monica Moran, please come up. Hi, uh, Monica Moran, 37 Carriage Lane. I want to start by thanking all of you and everybody who's worked on this and I'm here strongly in favor of lifting the borrowing cap. Um, I think everyone's been really articulate. I don't have much to add in terms of facts. I will add that um, excuse me, my uh, youngest child, uh, well, both my kids I raised here, my youngest is 21. They pretty much grew up as an elementary school kid in the library, not so much as a teen because there wasn't a space really that worked, but they never lost their love for the library. And they uh, couldn't come today because they are working at the library in Tivoli, New York, where they go to college. So they want to become a librarian. And um, they are so excited about the library expansion. And the you know they've looked at the stuff and they're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And maybe I'll even come back to Amherst and work in this library. So I just um, partly just want to say thank you to the town for the great you know stuff the the great experiences she had in the library, but also, you know, to ask to have the vision for the young people. She thinks the designs are fabulous. She thinks it would be a much more welcoming space. Um, so for you know to to bring in people, young people like that, I think um, this is a great project. And again, I'm just really grateful. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. Nina Mankin, please come up. My name is Nina Mankin, and I have been a resident. My family's been a resident in Amherst for almost six decades. We've been paying taxes here for almost six decades, and I very much look forward to my teenager having a space in the center of town to be able to go to because I won't let him go to the basement of the library now. Um, I want to say that as a child, I saw the vibrant community that we had downtown. 
I've witnessed that community and that space, that vibrancy diminish to almost nothing in my lifetime. And I've watched it grow. And I applaud the efforts of the town and all of the people who are trying to bring back that kind of vibrancy. And I, I've seen 21st century community libraries that are incredibly different than a 20th or a 19th or an 18th century library. And I've seen what they've done for communities. Um, in other Western countries, governments pay to build and update public libraries. In our country, if we're lucky, we get a government incentive for our community to buck up and raise those funds. I am incredibly grateful for the volunteers and professionals that Jones Library has brought together to realize what I believe is a truly American dream. And they are doing an amazing job. In my mind, this is a cause for unity and celebration and most certainly for municipal support and gratitude for the tens of millions of dollars in investment that this group is bringing to us. I was in town meeting in 27. I was a member of town meeting in 2017 when we voted to move forward with this state grant. That is a vote about fulfilling a dedication to a project that we now have the opportunity to realize. Our electorate has voted in favor of fulfilling that promise and I ask you to honor that. Thank you. Thank you. That's everyone on my list. Okay, thank you. That concludes public comment. Um, sure. I just want to apologize to my colleagues and the public for uh, showing my support uh, to one person who was speaking about coming out of the closet. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, all right. Uh, we are going to rapidly move through the consent agenda. And uh, let me just mention that... Um, the town manager and I are supposed to give our state of the town addresses tonight. We are not going to do that until we finish the solar bylaw because of the all of the people who are here for other reasons. Um, the following item was selected and I'm going to just tell you up front that the only item on the consent agenda is referral of the charter review committee appointment recommendation process to GOL, Governance Organization and Legislation Committee. The other item that was on the consent agenda was the 2024 Town Council meeting calendar. And I've removed that because it was apparent that there were some need for discussion. Uh, so the motion is to move the following item and the printed motions there under and approve those item that item as a single unit. Referral of Charter Review Committee appointment recommendation process to GOL. Committee, is there a second? Second. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Then we'll move to um, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Uh, Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Jo Haneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Uh, Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmilton. Yes. It's unanimous. Thank you. Um, so we're going to skip over item seven for the moment and move right on to action item eight which is the supplemental appropriation for the expansion and renovation of the Jones Library said sum to supplement the amount appropriated under the Town Council April 5th, 2021 order approving and authorizing borrowing funds for the expansion and renovation of the Jones Library. Given the length of the motion, I'm going to ask that the town clerk, I mean, the clerk to the Town Council, please put it on the screen.
be in, in accordance with charter section 5.6, having been published on the town bulletin board for a minimum of 10 days on November 9, 2023, a public forum held on November 20th, 2023, and having been received by the finance committee, reviewed by the finance committee report of December 4th, 2023, to appropriate the sum of nine million eight hundred sixty thousand one hundred dollars for the expansion and renovation of the Jones Library location at 43. Amity Street, Amherst, Massachusetts, said some to supplement the amount appropriated under the Town Council's April 5, 2021 order approving and authorizing borrowing of funds for the expansion and renovation of the Jones Library for a total appropriation of $46,139,800 and to meet the supplemental appropriation hereunder to authorize the treasurer with the approval of the town manager to borrow said amount under the under and pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 44, Section 7 or 8, or pursuant to any other enabling authority and to issue bonds or notes of the town thereof. Therefore, is there a second? Second, Haneke. Thank you. Now, with that, the floor is open for discussion. Andy, no, I'm sorry. It's not open for discussion. We are going to go to the Finance Committee report. Actually, I needed to make a disclosure. Okay, please do. Yes. Um, I need to make a disclosure of an appearance of conflict of interest as required by Mass General Law Chapter 268A, chap uh, Section 23B3. My wife is a part-time employee of the library working a half day per week branch libraries. Uh, I have consulted with the Ethics Commission. Public employees um, are not allowed to participate if uh, in a public, uh, excuse me, public employees may not participate in their public position in matters in which there's any immediate family member who has a financial interest. I have consulted with the Ethics Commission and uh, determined that neither I nor a member of my family will have any financial benefit or loss as a result of the council decision on this matter. Thank you. Are there any other disclosures that need to happen at this time? None. Then uh, Andy, Finance Committee report. The Finance Committee report um, has been provided in writing to the council and it has been placed in the packet. And so Point I of order, Andy, uh, we can't hear you on Zoom. Speak closer to the mic. Okay, I'll try again. Does that work, Michelle? Michelle, yes. Yeah, okay. It does. Okay. Um, as I said, the Finance Committee um, report is um, been has been provided to the town council as a written report and is available and has been available um, for the past several days um, in the packet so it's available to the public. Therefore, I'm not going to repeat the entire report, but just to indicate that the committee voted um, and uh, made two took two separate actions. Um, the first one was to ask the town manager to um, approach the uh, Jones Library about uh, an amendment to the memorandum of agreement. Um, and uh, he has uh, reported back to us about um, the results of that discussion. And I think that it um, addresses the issues that uh, we wanted to make sure that were clarified. Uh, the second one was the motion to recommend uh, that we, uh, as a committee, recommend to the council uh, that you approve the motion that is on the floor. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um I'm going to ask the town manager to up, update us regarding the memorandum of agreement discussions with the Jones Library trustees. 
Thank you, Lynn. <clears throat> Thank you, Lynn. So after the Finance Committee meeting, uh, the Finance Committee voted to ask for a second memorandum amendment to the memorandum of agreement with the library trustees. Uh, we've drafted something up. The library trustees um, have, I believe, is in the packet tonight. And basically, it was to clarify how the funds were going to flow because the, the two other agreements were were not as explicit. And we tried to make the I tried to make this as explicit as possible. Uh, that information has been delivered to the town council. The library trustees uh, vote met on Friday afternoon, and they voted to support this in principle. This there's not a signed agreement, but this is sort of what you have in front of you is the the framework for what would be agreed to. Okay. Um, I might also mention at that meeting, which I observed but was not part of, uh, the library trustees also voted uh, that upon approval by the town council of the Jones Library renovation and expansion project, the library shall begin to transfer the assets derived from the following funds, Stone, Potash, Fottis, B, E, and R, Van Steinberg, and Runberg to the town for the use on the project. The estimation at this time is that it is, that amount is a little over two hundred and ninety thousand um, dollars. So, with that, we the floor is now open for council questions and discussion. Pam Rooney. Thank you, and I appreciate all the comments that were made tonight. Um, it gives a very good sense of uh, the opinions of the folks who showed up tonight. Um, I appreciate also that the uh, town manager is beginning to work again with the uh, Jones trustees and would greatly appreciate um, a memorandum of, of agreement that in fact um cements the the commitment by the library by the Jones trustees uh to cover the distant difference in the cost to the project so i would i would love to see um a finalized or close to finalized moa that can be shared with the council um before i'm ready to vote on um how that before I'm ready to vote on it. Are there specific things, you have a copy of the MOA. Are there specific things that you were looking for? Is this the place to discuss yes. our, our desires and? Yes. Okay. Am I the right person to be speaking? You're the one that has the floor. Yes, I I would like very much to um, I would like to look at the uh, item number five, which is uh, the fact that the library has agreed to provide funds of X amount, which is the thirteen eight for the balance of the new pro total project share. I would like to have included in that in that statement or as needed to complete the project, something of that nature, it's very important that if there is yet another difference in the amount that the, the library is not capped at contributing simply, and it's a very large amount, uh, 13822518. So if it came in significantly over that, I would wanna make sure that it is also clear that they will provide those funds. Okay. Mr. Bachelman, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, so I want to be clear what the council is voting on tonight. Uh, um, so the request is to vote on an appropriation amount of $46.1 million. That's the number. If the number, if the bid comes in higher than that, and there isn't a way to value engineer it down, we cannot sign a contract higher than that amount without an additional action by the town council to provide the the funding for uh, the difference. So um, 
so I just want to be clear what, you know, if people saying, oh, cost escalations, the number you are asking to being asked to to approve tonight is 46.1 million as stated in, in the actual motion. Um, and then the idea of the memorandum of agreement is to outline exactly where that $46.1 million will come from. Some of it will come from the, from the town through a borrowing that the town, the council has to authorize um, or has already authorized. Um, some of it will come from the MBLC and the rest of it will come from the Jones Library and their fundraise, different, various fundraising efforts and securing other grants. So I hope that it helps clarify um, that it can't go above 46.1 million unless the council appropriates additional funds. Pam, please. So I think that that we're all in agreement that we could easily say to the to the trustees, then number five and or even number six could have that kind of writing in it or as needed to complete the project just to remind us all that that is where the difference or the remainder of any project comes in. If they come in lower than that amount, great. Um, but if it comes in over the 13.8, um, I just want it in writing. I'm I'm not comfortable uh, voting on, uh, on a new authorization without having that in writing. Okay. Jennifer, you have your hand up. I'm sorry. Oh, it's taken down. I'm sorry. Of course, Dorothy. Uh, this question is probably to Paul. Um, what I think so many people are afraid of is that we're going to be in a position where the town has spent tremendous money and the library too. And we're going to find out that we have to spend more and more and more. And people say, well, you just have to do it. And that we'll be just forced to do it at a cost of public safety, which is a concern that people keep bringing to me again and again and again. People want the library to be clean and safe and up to date, but not at the cost of, of you know, public health and public safety. So how far down the road can the town be, can someone come to the town and say, listen, I know you said did this and you gave that, but here we are and we just can't do it. And they've raised the price. I wonder how far down that can be or whether this would happen earlier in the process. Mr. Bachman. Well, the council is its own body. Anybody can make a motion when they see fit. So um, that's totally in the, in the hands of the town council. Um, you know, I think once we, when we get to a bid document, and I think someone spoke eloquently about why you need the appropriation before you go out to bid. Companies will spend tens of thousands of dollars preparing a bid for this project. If they and if there's if the funding isn't secured, they may decide not to su support put in a bid for the project. They need you know they're not going to expend a lot of money to prepare a bid document. This is a pretty extensive bid document that we ask for because it's a it's a significant major public building and a lot of things that they have to comply with. So once the bid um, is is secured and we have a contract, that's when we will know what the what the cost is. But the problem with that, and it's like we've done this with the library, with the school as well. We've appropriated a sum of money. It's up to the building committee now to um, we've done um, to bid out a project that we think will fit within the cap that potentially that you, if you vote the forty six point one million, to vote a project that will come in under that borrowing that appropriation. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the way you do that is you do some value engineering, you have add-ons. If, if we have money, we will do these things, but that's, that's going to be the building committee's responsibility to do that. Okay. Thank you. Anna. So I was thinking about what Pam was suggesting. And I think my concern at first, I was like, sure, right. Like we should we should absolutely put some sort of caveat in there. But then I think where my concern goes is that we kind of actually make the MOU weaker in doing that because we're not setting a specified amount. And I believe that if I mean, this is the this is the limit, right? that that borrowing is the limit. And so by setting a set standard on what the town is responsible for and what the trustees are 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 responsible for, we're setting the expectation that this is the final vote that we're going to take on this and that any extra costs would start this whole 
process of revoting a borrowing authorization over again, which no one wants to do. So I think for me, the specificity is important because I think it shows that this is it that math adds up and that is the cap. Like that is the limit on the on the borrowing. I think that's how I'm working it through in my in my head. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. I I I have a, a longish statement. I won't go super long, Lynn, but I just want to make two comments about uh the agreement we're looking at. One is it's an amendment to an existing agreement that it still refers to. And some of this confusion is coming from that we didn't have time to rewrite the whole um, original, the 2021. So in the original, those terms still are there, that every time the library gets money, they're going to transfer to us and some of these commitments and authorization. So I think the effort to strengthen this wording, even if it's repetitive, is worth doing because it's hard to read two documents. Um, the other quick comment, Lynn, is I'm a little surprised um, on the actual order um, that it doesn't have the additional table. When we voted in 2021, we said anticipated funding sources, and we had a very clear document, and that's been helpful to me, um, and I have a copy of it because the Finance Committee got it. It was just reminding ourselves of what the library's obligation was, what the MBLLC, and I'd like that added. Paul has it. I would just like it added to the order. It, it That's the document that we were provided back, um, I believe it was the... 13th of November. Yeah, and it, it just, when we did the order in 2021, it was anticipated funding sources, which was okay. a way we did it attached to the order. So it just made it very clear of there were some big numbers coming in. But I, I just want to make, so I just want to suggest that if we attached it to the order, it would be helpful. Okay. Um, it is the intent. So I, I want to say that I really applaud the trustees and our state and congressional legislative reps for what they've been able to do. They've secured more than four and a half million dollars in four large grants. I voted against continuing a year ago because I didn't believe anything like this was possible. They have certainly exceeded my expectations and there is a lot of money at risk. I am still concerned about the financial risk to the town that it, although the intentions are to limit it to 15.8 um, and the 1 million in CPAC, that these could be higher because there's still a gap. So the reason I'd like to see a tighter ban, um, both on the assurance that any higher, any shortfall will be the trustee's obligation and a commitment in its item nine right now that trustees would be willing to pay a share of the short-term ban costs. And just for all the audience out there, um, with the best guess on funding flow right now, that's it comes to about 750,000 over a two-year period. And that money's, or three-year, it's gotta come out of our cash flow. So um, if they can't accelerate money enough to bring it down, I'd like to amend the clause in the ban and say there would be a willingness to share that cost. Um, with that kind of change, I am cautiously willing to say yes on this project, because I think we do have, uh, we don't have a plan B. It really has died against the wall, um, and the library needs urgent action. I also have heard more and more, and we heard tonight on the positive side of an expanded space. If I think of this as public space, of our space, of our community space, we need space for music events, festive gatherings, celebrations, and more. Families with young children coming and meeting together, not just to get books. And so if we really think that we're gonna have a new public space and there's gonna be programming, that others of us can work on, not just library functions, but also this, this is an exciting opportunity. So if we can tighten the MOA, I can commit, be convinced to be a cautious yes. And I want to remind people, I voted way back when I abstained because I was worried about the risk. Then I voted no, because I thought the risk was extreme last year. Um, I think it's still high, um, but we can't get rid of it altogether. So the council owes it to the taxpayers to get as tight a ban 
agreement as we can and to keep the incentive on the trustees to get us money quickly because they're on the hook for some of that short-term interest. So keeping that incentive, I know they want to. So I, I'll end there with my comments. The other thing we have been told publicly, um, I would like a commitment that no one's coming back to us for furniture, for uh, audio visual, because I know the budget's very tight that they'll raise monies for that. Cause we don't, we're not gonna have the capital funds over the next few years. We want the library to be really functional. And there is a commitment to secure a bank loan if they need to, because the funding doesn't come up to what they need. I think that's a great idea and I think it's feasible. So I would like it to not just be a verbal commitment, but to have it somewhere in writing that the trustees are really working on behalf of the whole town, not just the library. Thank you. Anna, you have your hand up again. I remembered the second part of my comment. Um, the other thing I was curious about is to the earlier point regarding the specificity of the amount the library is responsible for raising. Um, does that mean that if they somehow miraculously raise more than that, that they can't give that to the project as well? Uh, I think my question is if, if for some reason they go over, are we then limiting that contribution and possibly eliminating a possibility to reduce the burden on the town? I'm just, it's a very optimistic take, but I, I just wanted to say it. Great take. Um, having been part of a capital campaign that raised more than we needed, I'll tell you what we did. We put it in a fund and said it could only be used for purposes of that project. And guess what? Furniture, et cetera, is purposes of that project. So to my, in my mind, they can spend it on the project. Noted. Um, Paul, you had your hand up. I was going to say the same thing that it, it they don't have it would be for this project, but um, they it'd be funds. Their only commitment is to the funds that we put down on the piece of paper. Okay. So there's two questions that have been raised about the MOU. One is a question about what happens if the project cost is greater and can we add to the MOU something that suggests that the library would be responsible for any increase? And the other is that the library would participate in sharing the cost of interest on the short-term bans. Um, I would like uh, agreement, if you don't mind, to have the cash flow sh shown uh, for a moment. and specifically the um, second table. There was a revised cash flow developed um, on and shared with the Finance Committee on November 28th. That is the cash flow that you're now looking at. And the reason I wanna show this is because the reason that we, uh, no, let's, that is page, that is attachment A. This is this we received from the library. It was based on receiving this from the library that the numbers were plugged in for the library contributions. Um, I wanna now point out that when you get to um, January 31st, 2025, you see that the first bands is borrowed, that's 14 million. At that point, the library has shown has actually paid in a fair amount, but they still have about two million more to go. In addition to that, we haven't received all of the MBLC payments. In fact, the MBLC payments, there's still, I believe, if you'll scroll down to the next page, two more to go, three more to go. So the cost of the bands, interesting, the short-term borrow interesting is actually more because of, or it's about equal because of the payment due from MBLC as well as the payments still due from the library. So in keeping that in mind, now I wanna talk about what we've heard from various people in public meetings. None of this is me personally, okay? We've heard in public meetings that one, we are, have already, there's already been discussions opened with Amherst College as to whether they would increase the rapidity or the speed with which they would provide their money. That's number one. The second is, is there a way in which the National Endowment for the Humanities 
and the other federal grant based on match would be able to pay earlier. And that still needs to be explored. The third issue that's been brought up in that is been confirmed in fact by our financial advisor for the town. And that is when MBLC at the end of the year has money left, they don't wanna give it back because they don't wanna lose it. And so what they do is they give it to their existing projects. And so although they have actually um, promised a sixth payment of 1.6 million, thanks to Senator Comerford and Representative Dom for working so hard for that, that payment will actually probably be received over the five-year period of the other payments because they give money when they have it because they don't want to give it back to the Commonwealth. And that was, as I mentioned, confirmed by David Eisenthal, our own financial advisor, because he has seen that happen in other towns. So the possibility of having more money come in earlier is already being looked at. That's my purpose of pointing all of that out. And the reason I wanted to show that is because when we look at the MOU, we have already stated the following. Um, the, the library and the town will do everything possible to expedite providing funds to the town to avoid a minimize or minimize the amount and timing of the short-term loans slash bans during construction. This will not increase the new library share of the project. So in other, so in other words, paying early doesn't mean you pay more. It just means you pay early, thus reducing the need to borrow. Um, so with that, I'm going to go back to other people that might like to speak. Jennifer. Um, but I guess it's picking up on Kathy's suggestion. I mean, could <laughs> we still amend that number nine or to, to add language to the effect of, you know, as needed, the library will participate in paying down the interest on the short-term bans? So I, I want to go back to the issue of the MOU. We don't sign the MOU. The town manager signs the MOU. Okay. If the if what we're asking is the town manager to go back and negotiate yes. with the board of trustees to make amendments to the MOU, then um, we can, uh, like the finance committee did, uh, make a motion that suggests that they, you would like to see have the town manager look into this as a possibility. That's all. We otherwise we don't just like we don't sign contracts, we also don't sign MOUs, MOAs. So I did have a question. So the the MOA still needs to be agreed upon by the trustees. Yes, it does. <clears throat> it so, needs to be signed by the trustees. They have agreed in principle. And can that happen before we vote? It would have to happen when the trustees have an actual meeting. So it delays our vote. Mandy Joe. Um, a couple of things. The trustees have agreed in principle to signing that MOU. I don't see why we cannot trust our fellow elected officials that they will uphold their word on that agreement. Um, I'm looking at the cash flow, revised cash flow flow um, from 2021, April of 2021. Um, that was provided to us when we first voted this. And if I read that, it's hard to read, but um, what I read from that one is that um, we were going to take out 15 million uh, on that revised cash flow that was given to us in 2021 when we originally voted this project in March of 2023 and start incurring bans and go bonds. Um, in March of 2023 for this project before the 6 million from the trustees would have been raised. And then another 2.7 million in March of 2024 
and another 2.25 million in March of 2024, so that all bans would have been issued, um, I believe, two years before the project was finished, including the bans needed to do short-term borrowing from the 6 million from the library trustees. The new cash flow, um, from what I can potentially understand, um, is that we are trying to minimize that. But what I guess I'm not seeing is much of a difference in how much that cash flow borrowing is in bands between what we were suspecting would be required by the town when we voted in 2021 to authorize this project because of the library financing and when the money would come in then and the expected borrowing for now. The interest rates are different from 2021 because, well, the interest rates were different then, but we've authorized that borrowing and the interest rates would be whatever they were when we borrowed, um, which if we borrowed the money in 2023, I can tell you the rate that was predicted in 2021 of 2.80% would never have happened. Uh, we know that because six months ago, it would not have happened. Um, we would have been at the four or five that's being predicted now. Um, so I guess I don't understand where the concern is about the interest rate now, because it looks to me like the money we authorized and knew might need to be paid by bands, including bands, for the money we were expecting the town, the trustees to raise back when we authorized this project in 2021 has not really changed. And so if in 2021, we were not forcing or expecting or asking for an MOU that the library incur the interest payments on those bands for their portion. I'd like to know why we are expecting it now and that that indication has changed. Lynn, can I respond? Uh, uh, Pam's actually got her hand up, but if Pam wants to yield to you, that's fine. Go ahead. Mandy? Um, I am looking at exactly the same sheet as you are. And one thing you didn't mention is that we were told that the total interest on the 5 million for the short-term bans in 2021, the total would be 48,000. That was the sum. And it was so small compared to everything else we were doing. It just didn't draw any attention. And it's because we were borrowing only 5.5 million for six months, two six month spans. Now we're talking about borrowing $22.7 million in one year each bands for an optimistic $750,000. So it's that difference that um, will put pressure on our capital budgets. At 48,000, it was just a small amount of money and we, we have a five year and a 10 year plan that it would be quickly absorbed. We have a very tough picture when I look at 2025 and 2026, um, if we have to bear all that cost. And yes, if the trustees expedite and bring more in, remember we are already looking at their best guess, but if they could bring in several million more, we wouldn't have to borrow as much. It's, it's because of that additional cost of the library and that there's a gap that we're having to borrow more. And Lynn is absolutely right. Some of that interest cost is because NBLC is paying us slower. So it's not all because of the library's piece. So what I wanted to do is as needed a share of, and I have specific wording. So it is to lower the pressure on our capital budgets, um, absorbing 500,000 in the first year. Another, we have the specific numbers is really difficult given what we had already put on the books for those years. So yes, there were bans before, yes, there are bans now, but it's a quantitative huge difference in terms of the impact. Um, May it I pales, pales when you compare it to 46 million, but it's yeah. still real money. Okay, Mandy, you wanted to, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna let this conversation fit go back and forth until we, Settle with this. So the page I'm looking at has bands of 2.3 million, 2.26 million, and eight and a half million, not just 2 million, Kathy. And they were all for a full year 
They were all at different interest rates. Those interest rates were speculative because, well, we don't know the actual interest rates and those interest rates would not have held, um, number one. Number two, the 22 million you just cited for this project is not the trustee's share that you're citing interest on. That's also our share on bands. That's also the MBLC one, all of which our share in the MBLC shares, we would be paying anyway. Are you two looking at the same document? Where, where I'm looking at the one that was in, I'm looking at the one that was in the financial packet and there were only two, two bands and it was dated at the same time we were starting to vote on this. So this if there's a more updated one, my point was it was just much smaller and the gap, the, tr the gap in what the trustees funding was, was only 5.5. .5. It was just a lower okay. amount. I, so for the so purpose the of the public, excuse me, yeah. but for the purpose of the public record, Kathy, I need you to advance to the town clerk of the town council, the document you're looking at. Mandy Joe, what document are you? My document was in the April 5th, 2021 packet, the day we voted that bond um, titled 8B. Uh, Jones Library Trustees financial information regarding expansion project presentation and video. Then Mandy should advance hers because I, it's more yes. recent than mine. Absolutely. Uh, I would like you to advance yours to Athena, Athena so that can both pull can be it right posted. up from the packet from April 5th, 2021. Thank you. We do that because when a document is referred to in a public meeting, we then need to make sure it is available to the full public. Did you want me to bring up a specific page, Mandy? The pages I was on, let me go find them again, um, were, I had page down, so now I have to page back up to find what ones I was looking at. Hold on. It's a Can long you document. Make it bigger? Uh, pages 19, it, it was an 81 page document. It's pages 19 of 81 and 20 of 81. Okay. And please make that larger. Thank you. This is very similar to the previous document that you got that the public and the finance committee received for the meeting on the 28th of November. So it's the bans, if you will, that go bonds and bans. We have a $15 million one, a two, $2, 750,000 and another 2,250,000. Uh, they use interest rates over here, by the way, those interest rates are like fantasy. Uh, I, they're not like fantasy, they are fantasy. And then as you can see, when you go down to the bottom of this chart, the short-term bans, the total uh, on the short-term bans is 48. And does this show the interest on those short-term bans? It was, that it, was the list right there. It does, right there. Now that this is the repair option, Aunt Mandy. The first one is exactly the same number I read. It's forty-eight thousand, with two with two. So go up. It's exactly what I read out. So I think the number didn't change. It's got two short-term bands. If you go up to the top, each at about um, a six-month period, March through July, then an, another one coming in. And that's why the end, it's a combination of borrowing less at a lower rate for a shorter amount of time. So I'm, I'm not, uh, my main point is it's a lot bigger now and that none of us paid attention to that short-term interest column because it was so small. I apologize for not seeing that the next page was repair option. Thank you. Both documents have been added to the, uh, the thing. Uh, I'm going to go back to Pam. Thank you. Uh, one of the other, uh, I, I too do appreciate the uh, the trustees and the work, uh, but as we go back and discuss the MOA again, um, item number nine says, uh, there, and there's a term that's called the new library share. The new library share um, is essentially what the, the trustees have agreed to. And number nine in the MOA says the library in the town will do everything possible to expedite providing funds to the town, as we discussed, to or minimize to avoid or minimize the amount and timing of the short term loans bans during construction period. This will not increase the new library share for the project. And I think that to me speaks 
loudly that um, the trustees do not expect that they would pay any more than the 13822518 that was stated previously in item number five. So to say this will not increase the new library share of the project, it may. Those bids may come in above the amount that we're, that we're expecting. And to make a statement that it won't increase is something that probably should be struck from this agreement. So the intent on nine was not to increase, but by expediting, you would not take out as high a band. So by expediting the payment, it would not be additional money. It would be getting money earlier. Can we say then this expediting will not increase the library share? Sure. Yeah. Other otherwise, it reads like, we don't care what happens. It ain't going to increase the price. Right. So okay. in other words, expediting payment will not increase the new library share of the project. That does not change the meaning. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask that you take the image down for the moment, and I'm going to call on Councillor Walker. Alicia? Um, thank you, Lynn. <clears throat> um, I just have a couple of concerns. Um, most have been brought up, but I want to know... Um, well, there are there's some important information that we haven't been able to consider that would help me to feel like I'm making an informed decision here, uh, like the five-year capital budget and 10-year debt projections, um, financial modeling that shows the impact on our reserves and the timeline for the DPW and fire station. Um, and I know I asked for a lot of this information, but what I asked for was a lot of information. So um, with the short time frame, it it's not that I expected to have all of these things available, but I do feel like I'm being rushed to make this decision um, and that I would absolutely benefit from having more time to consider and to be able to review these types of documents with this kind of information. Um, my other concern is also about the language in the MOA. Um, again, a lot of my concerns have been brought up, the wording for number uh, nine to be amended. Um, I agree that I would feel more comfortable with more specificity and would like to see um, some language about what would happen if something doesn't go as planned. Um, I know we've had discussions about a loan or the, the possible use of endowments, and I would like to see language added on those things. Um, and I would also like to see the cash flow added as a schedule of the MOA. And I think some of these things would provide a lot more security for the town. Um, and so my question is, what would it look like in terms of process for us to ask the town manager to make amendments to the MOA, um, to, to uh, make those agreements with the trustees and then to come back and have the vote at another time? What would that look like? And is that possible in terms of process at this time? It is possible that the town manager could meet again with the trustees between now and our next meeting on the 18th. At that point, they could have another discussion about this MOA, and then the trustees would have to go back and agree to it in principle. So do the trustees have another meeting? Sorry, I'm not sure if I missed that before. They can schedule another meeting with all the requirements met for pu for posting a public meeting. Um, is that something that's possible for us to know if that's a, like, is that a realistic possibility that we can determine on by ourselves right now, or would we need to hear back from the trustees to know whether or not that that's possible? I certainly don't speak for the trustees, but I'll use this last week as an example. Within the matter of using the 48 hour rule, they posted a meeting for Friday of this past week. They held that meeting. They actually had a meeting posted for today, but they canceled that meeting. So it seems to me that by example, they have been able to demonstrate their ability to schedule meetings. Okay, and sorry, just a, another question in terms of process, because is that something that's possible for us to decide at this point with a motion already on the floor for some for a different action? The motion on the floor is for a certain action. If we want additional information from the trustees, we could table the motion on the floor.
I'm looking to you, Athena. If you were to lay the motion on the table to pause discussion, that would be in order to act on a different motion that needed to be addressed first. Thank you. So if there were a, a different motion that you wanted to take up before that, then you could lay it on the table or else you could postpone the motion on the floor to a certain time. Okay, thank you. Michelle Miller, you have your hand up. That's what I was gonna ask if we can postpone to a date certain based on this discussion um, and based on the current motion that's on the table. We certainly can postpone to a date certain. Uh, I also want to just mention that while we can take this discussion, the town manager has certainly hear it, heard it. I know that there's a number of trustees in the audience, both on Zoom and in person, and they've heard it. That does not guarantee that they will agree to that. What they've agreed to in principle is the uh, MOU before you. Um, Paul, you have your hand up. Yeah, so I would just want to make sure <clears throat> if this is the direction the council decides to go in, that we have the entire universe of concerns that the council has that would enable you to vote um, whenever you choose to take it up next. Uh, what would be very, I would not want to be engaged in is sort of this back and forth multiple times type of thing. Um, if you know, and, and we don't know if the trustees are open to these ideas or not. What our mission was, was to get clarity on from the finance committee, was to get clarity on the terms of the payments, which we did in the memorandum of agreement. And also, and on top of that, I, I attempted to um, get the willingness of the trustees to minimize the amount that we are paying on the bands, which are bond anticipation notes. This is money we borrow in a short term till the money comes in. It's usually for six months, a year, something like that. If we get the money in soon, more money sooner, um, then we don't have to borrow as much and for as long a time. So that lowers that cost of the bond anticipation. So and that was the goal. And they had expressed willingness. I think you heard tonight, they have funds set aside that they're going to transfer the town earlier, um, like immediately, um, that they're willing to show their good faith effort to, to do that. Um, you know, I think this this is the memorandum of agreement is is pretty clear, and it represents in, in the fact that the trustees have already e expressed their um, openness to it. My concern on the bans language is that we it changes the economic um, understanding of the proposal between the two bodies, and and right now the bans were always anticipated and it was always on every spreadsheet was as budget in our capital improvement program, in fact, to be covered by the town. That's the same, that's the way we always handle our short-term borrowing. Um, the, it sound, it, the counselors are saying that those funds should be actually adjusted by the trustees, then that, that's, that we, I will go with that uh, request. But I, I just wanna know that, want you to know that we did take the, make the effort and achieved the ability to, their commitment to lower the length of time, the, minimize the length of time that we would borrow money and to lower the amount that we would have to borrow. So that was that was the mission I was I felt I had after the finance committee meeting last Tuesday. Shalini. Um, I think I'm hesitant to change the language around um, anything that suggests that the amount could increase in the memorandum of understanding, uh, even if we are saying that that's going to be on the trustees, because uh, my understanding is that the amount that we're setting here is, is what is signaling to the bidders that this is the highest amount within which you're expected to bid. And leaving that open is leaving us vulnerable to higher bids. So I think that's another reason we want to just leave it as tight as possible. And the other thing about, um, as everyone else, a few other people have pointed out and Paul just pointed out, uh, with respect to interest, we did account for that in April of 2021 when we voted. And, and given everything that has happened, some things were outside all of our control. Uh, there was a request for the vote going to the residents. We did that in 20, 
21, November 2022, because of COVID, because of the delays, there has been a tremendous amount of increase, which the trustees have graciously taken on all on themselves. They're not asking to split with the town or they're taking all of that. And they have proven themselves, as Kathy stated, they have shown that they are, you know, they've almost raised the amount that this is the cost increase of $9 million. They've already raised that. We have town, they've raised nine million, or advocated through the advocacy, they've been able to raise $9 million, which more than covers for the increase, almost covers the increase. Uh, all this to say that, you know, we have an amazing group of people here who are raising funds, who are residents, the trustees, um, professional people. And as some of the people have suggested today, it is something that we should be celebrating that we have so many residents. We have the state at the state level, at the local level, we have um, the uh, historic commissions, all of these agencies supporting the Jones Library. And I think right now we're just, um, um, I, one last thing I do want to address is that there is a concern that was raised, even though 75% of the emails we've received have been in support of the project. But I do want to acknowledge the 25% people who have talked about concerns about increases in taxes. So I don't, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, that this is not going to increase your taxes. Yes, it is becoming more expensive to live in Amherst and there are many reasons and we should talk about that at CRC. Um, you're welcome to come to that meeting, a committee. Um, but the library has, whatever we had committed to, that's what we're doing right now. And the rest is being taken on by the trustees. So there is not gonna be any increase in taxes on the residents because of the library. And everyone is working super hard to make sure that's going to happen. So I just wanted to also put that out there. Anika. Thank you. Um, I appreciate what you just said, Shalini. And um, so I'm also just thinking about um, what we're talking about here is just really being part of a technical process of really any project um, of the scale and um, something that's really needed to build confidence in terms of for healthy bidding and um, funding for future programming, some of which uh, would be very unique for this region. Uh, but in terms of those that are considering postponing or wanting more information, I have a question just in regards to what specifically um, is being looked for. Like, within this time, like into when? So is this by the next meeting? So what what are what are we or those who have asked, what are you what specifically again are you looking for? Or specific changes and and then just last, um, have any of these already been in discussion and have been already round circled with the trustees? Thank you, Anika. Uh, Andy? appreciate the uh, desire of the council to um, make sure that you have a full understanding of the agreement that we have. But I think that we also have to be realistic about what is at stake here. Because if we, you know, if the concern is the implication and the pressure that this might place on our capital plan, I think you also have to look at the um, ultimately, not necessarily tonight, depends upon when we vote, but when we vote, yeah, we have to consider the impact of saying no to the uh, proposal that what it will have as an impact on our capital plan over the next years, because we know that we're then in a position where the town is going to be looked to to do repairs that we would have done years ago, but did not do the library did not do unnecessary only things that were absolutely necessary because it was um, a wise idea to put it off. 
and to try and share the problem here. So to speak, don't um, address it at this point. And Andy, you can't be heard. If we don't address it at this point, then the next thing that's going to happen is that we're going to have the town capital plan looking at the repairs that are going to cost, which were originally estimated in the um, memo in the fall State, of, yeah. of 19 to 21 million. And now they're increased significantly of things that were not anticipated in the process removal and code. So what the impact is, it's going to be much greater. Okay. Michelle? I'd like to give Alicia, if Alicia wants to speak before me, um, I can wait. Alicia? Um, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to um, sort of just respond to a few of the previous counselors in saying that um, I did send a, a list of information that I would like to see to the town manager um, prior to last week's council meeting and not to anyone's fault because I know it was a long list of information and such a short period of time to gather such information but I'm still interested on receiving that information and do still believe that it will help me feel like I'm making an informed decision. Um, and it's a list of documents that I'd be happy to share if anyone wants to hear the full list of those things tonight, but I've already sent them to the town manager over a week ago. Um, and so again, those are some of the things that I would like to be able to review. Um, and I would like to just see the updated language in the MOA. So I, I would be interested at having more time to review those documents. Um, and I think we did hear that it's possible to do that in a way that doesn't necessarily delay being able to take next steps. And so I think that that's the direction that I'm leaning in tonight because I would like to know, I would like to have that security for the town and I would like to know that I'm making an informed decision. And I think as you know, to go off of what Andy said, it would be helpful to also see that um, in a five year, uh, capital plan, like what would it look like if we said no? What would it look like if we're moving forward with this? Like that, that is the exact information that I would like to be able to look at before making this decision. I just want to point out, we'll make sure that it's in the packet, but many of those, all of those questions were, were recorded and to the extent that we were able to answer them at the time. They were answered in the Q&A that was provided to the um, Finance Committee, including uh, the whole issue of indebtedness was in another chart. The issue of where do we stand with the capital plan? I know that the town manager has consulted, I believe, with our former finance director who has looked at the thing and does not see a significant difference. So that those questions, in fact, um, Alicia, were recorded. They are on the Q&A and there are answers to the best of our ability to provide them. Uh, Alicia, I mean, Michelle, I'm gonna come back to you. Okay, so if I understand, um, we have a revised MOU that has been agreed to by a handshake for now by the trustees, um, but that will be uh, put into some formality shortly. We also have additional requests um, for the MOU that have been um, raised by enough counselors tonight um, that I think that uh, postponing until a date certain, which I think would be the December 18th meeting in order to give the town manager the opportunity to negotiate those, uh, those additional requests with the trustees um, is, is a way to get us, I think, as a body uh, more solid in, in, in advancing this. So can I uh, make a motion now to- Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, is, is the motion to amend the current motion to, or to postpone the current motion uh, to 
December 18th um, so that the town manager has the opportunity to negotiate the additional requests as well as to uh, formalize the requests that have already been incorporated in the MOU. Athena? It would be a motion to postpone the motion on the floor to December 18th. Motion is on the floor. Is there a second? Second, Rooney. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Dorothy. Uh, I just want to say that um, the postponing, at least to my understanding, is not part of any plan of constantly working against this proposal but it's part of a plan of finding a way to yes so i strongly recommend that we do postpone it because i think that we can come together with just a little bit more clarification okay. mandy joe i would like clarification i guess from the counselors before i make a decision on this motion to postpone um and then i might have a question after that what exactly, I know there's been a lot of discussion about what might change, but what exactly would we be asking the town manager to renegotiate? And are we expecting a signed MOU before we vote? Because if we are, I'd like to have that discussion. Um, okay. And so I'd like from the counselors that are seeking changes to the MOU indication whether they are also expecting the trustees to sign an MOU before we've even agreed to borrow more money. I also want to stress that all the town manager can do is carry a message. It's up to the trustees as to whether they will negotiate terms. So with that, uh, Jennifer, you're one of the people that would like changes and Pam and Kathy. Jennifer. Okay, well, I do, I do want to um, ask a clarification. I think sure. it may be pretty obvious, but I, so the trustees wouldn't sign an MOU because they don't know if we're going to, I mean, that, that can't happen. So I guess what I'm asking Paul is when you say they've agreed to this in principle, have the trustees met and seen this MOU? Yes, they met on Friday afternoon. I wasn't at the meeting. I think Lynn was in attendance. I think she she talked about that. And what they what was reported back to me is that they voted in principle to support support it. I think they were hesitant to vote for it, um, not knowing if the council was going to vote for this or not. So if it's kind of the cart before the horse. I mean, it, what? Yeah. Well, we will it always be. So could they vote on it before? Not that they would sign it, but. If I have clarity in exactly what the council's expectations are, and it's a negotiation, it's not like put this in it, it happens. Um, and we're confident that there isn't anything else coming up, which is what my fear is, is that you're, I, I become an errand boy and it's going to go back and forth. It's not going to be, it's not going to be productive. And it's not fair to the, your, your fellow elected officials either. So I think if I have clarity about what it is, um, the pieces that you want to put into it that you're asking for, I'm happy to have that conversation with you. And, but I, again, I want to point out that's subject to the trustees agreeing. We can ask for whatever we want, but they have to agree. So I have another question, if I could really, because I was the one that brought it up about the trustees possibly being asked to participate in paying down the interest on the bands. And you're saying we don't want to do that. There's, I just want to be clear on that. I'm not a financial person. <laughs> well, we will take any money that anyone wants to give us because that reduces the, the amount that we're that's the, it, coming out of our capital for other things. So what, what we accomplished, I think was a good thing in that they agreed to push money to us as, as soon as they get it in a faster way. And also that will help us reduce the amount that we have to borrow and reduce the time we have to borrow it which does reduce the interest cost. So you don't feel we need to add that because of? Do we have to add it? it you know, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, the more we, 
I feel like we've been we've been very um, straightforward with the trustees. I think they're 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 elected officials like you are. I think we have to treat them with respect, and they have a, they represent the the library. You represent the town. It's, we're all on the same team, and I think the idea is to get to an agreement that everybody feels that they can, are responsibly can sustain. Uh, we're not, and um, you know, I think that they will. They have already shown that they will make a good faith effort to expedite funding to us. So I think to then sort of go the next step, you know, I certainly push for it if that's what the council feels is important for in order for you to say yes to this project. Yeah, I, I would trust your judgment. I... Okay, so the question is still on the floor. Uh, Kathy, Pam, which one of you wants to go next? Pam. I would, I really would like clarification on, I would expect that the town manager would work with the trustees would come up with an with an MOA that they will will offer up um, i i suspect once it's offered up it's not likely to change we can we can bless it it can get signed i was sort of thinking that the process would be that they would sign an agreement and bring it back to us to to show us that it's re reflecting everything that we've talked about um what is the process so do they sign the, before or after we vote in the past the mou has not been signed until after the vote we have we have always authorized the town manager to negotiate the mou based on the conversations we've had so i think that all we can expect from the trustees is what we've done in the past and what they did this time was to look at the MOU, agree in principle, and then we came back to the council meeting. If there are additional things that you would like the town manager to take to the trustees for them to consider, then this is the time to state that. Well, then I'll repeat what I I. I understand i heard what uh, was said about reflecting that there might be greater latitude in the dollar amount of the project um but however we can word it it makes it crystal crystal super clear that the town does not bear that any any differences in the amounts that were that we've been presented would be borne by the trustees and not by the town because we're already absorbing more. Okay. We're absorbing more in our in our interest rate period on the 158. Are you um okay. Paul, did you have anything you want to comment on that? Yes, yeah, so I just want clarity. So right now the, the number is 46.1 million. If it goes a dollar above that, it has to come back to the council. We can't, I can't sign a contract if it's above the amount that you appropriate tonight or whenever you decide to appropriate the funds, hoping you do appropriate the funds. So um, that's when you would have your, that con I would think that would be your, your next conversation, like whose side of the ledger is this additional cost and an extra dollar? Who's, who's going to pay that extra dollar? Now what you're, I think if I want to, I want to make sure I understand what you're asking, you're saying, I want to say now that that extra dollar is going to be paid by the trustees. That's what you want to say now. Is that okay? Understood. Okay. Kathy. Uh, first, I want to assure you that I won't do, uh, if, if, if you get some changes to strengthen this, there's not another list that you'll, that you'll hear from me. This is it. Um, so my concern, I mean, as Pam talked about items five and six, if there's any way of wording that to make it totally clear that the library is responsible for their complete share. And in the absence of the original grid, which had 46 million and all the different pieces, didn't make that 13.8 as clear. So if there's a way to do that, and I think the two clauses, five and six together, um, our, the concern is that we hit five, six, and seven. When we hit the two, three years down the road, if the trustees have not been able to successfully fundraise, we've heard verbally, and I've and and the 
treasurer has shown us real agreements that there's a potential of taking out a loan against the endowment to cover the gap. And that's, I think is covered that they will agree to find the fun money somewhere. So I'm not asking, you know, assurance that they'll go out, but I just want that as tight as written, Paul, as possible. And then item nine, those are five and six, no changes in seven or eight. And item nine, if we could add a sentence that says something like, as needed, comma, the library will participate in paying a share of the interest on the short-term bands. The point has been made here is that those short-term interest rates aren't really all the result of the library not able to give us their, if they could give us their whole 13, 8.8 .8 tomorrow, we would still have to have short-term bands because the others are slower. So the purpose of this would be to be fair, you know, but but say something about that. And conceptually, what I thought about is in this next three year period, there is an endowment that could send us some extra money if if funds aren't coming in as ex as fast as they expect, knowing they could be replenished by fundraising. So I'm not trying to put the endowment at long term risk, but trying to take some of the short term costs. So nine has been a concern for me. And, you know, early on, I, I raised this. I'm not sure. I realize that you'll go all out and you'll ask for it. And people will say you're crazy. And have you ever done this before <laughs> in any van interest? And we'll probably say never have we had to share it. So I understand this is different, but it is also different that we're in actually a public private partnership here. It is the whole thing is different. It's not, you know, so that, so the the cl clarity on five and six. So if everyone, if every lawyer in the room thinks that's clear, with or without the definitely the um, full amount, and then nine, I think that's it. I just, and and then I do know, as I mentioned earlier, that all the other if we had this other original MOA that's still standing. This is an amendment to that one, which still has wording. As soon as the library gets the money, they're going to send it to us. It has. We didn't lose any of that. No. So I just want people to understand that this isn't the only piece of paper. It's difficult to read too, but to know that the two are working together is important because that had some strong language in it that I don't want to lose. Okay. Are there any other comments regarding what is people are looking for in the MOA? Alicia, you have your hand up. Um, yes, thank you, Lynn. So Kathy covered just about everything that I was going to say, um, but I just wanted to add, um, I would like to see an indication of who is responsible for the campaign expenses. And I would like to see the cash flow added as a schedule um, to the MOA in addition to essentially everything Kathy said. Okay, thank you. Mandy Jo? I'm still confused about Pam Rooney's request about or more, because if we authorize borrowing of 46 point such million, we can't sign a contract above that. So that 13888225518 is as far as it can go under the borrowing we've authorized because the contract can't be above those numbers. And so I worry that any change to, or any indication that says, or additional provides any potential bidders with some thought that there may be additional borrowing capacity that we haven't told them about. And that concerns me because there isn't. And so I think what you're asking for actually puts the town also in a much odder situation than just listing this 13822518 number and saying, that's your share. If we if the bids don't come in there, we're back here discussing what we do about that. And that discussion might be changing 13822518 to a different number but we're back here discussing it. And so I don't understand why the language in five and six is not sufficient because there's no higher number than 13822518. May I respond? Please. 
Thank you. Mandy Joe, um, the town manager and I had that discourse and he did explain to me so I better understand why we would cap it at 13855518 or whatever the number is, right? And so I understand what he said. I nodded and I said, yes, but the key is that the extra will be paid by the trustees. And that was my, that's my message. However, he wants to incorporate that, that aspect to it, let him do it. I'm comfortable. I don't need to change the wording in number five and six anymore. Okay. Okay. Unless, unless it can be strengthened in some way. I, so I don't need that to the extra that is confusing me because I don't understand what you're meaning by the extra. Pam? When we come back, when, when, if something comes back at a higher number, I don't want to have another conversation about who's going to, is it going to be the town's share or is it going to be the library share? If the, if the, if another authorization is ever passed, which hopefully it will never be passed, right? And need, need be needed. If it comes yeah. back in the future at a higher authorization request, I just want to say now it just wants to be crystal clear that it's the trustees that are paying for it and not the town. Dorothy, I, I'm sorry. Okay, Dorothy. One of the things is there's rituals when you talk about money, which I find difficult. And one of them is that we don't talk about interest. Okay. So to me, the more does not mean raising the official cap. The official cap is there, but interest is not spoken of and it changes. And that's a concern that a lot of people have and that has been expressed tonight. So I had assumed that that was the interest. I understand Manny Joe's point. You really don't want, you want bidders to understand this is what we are cap and we really can't go beyond it without having to go through a whole bunch of things again. So uh, the concern that many people have expressed to me is to do with the increased interest, which is not talked about because it doesn't exist officially, but it does. That's it. Okay. Are there any other questions or comments with regard to wishes for the town manager to discuss with the, about the MOU with the library trustees? Understanding that based on past practice, the trustees will not sign the final MOU till after the council votes. Mandy Jo? Um, just two things. So given the conversations that happened, I think, it, are, are we down to the only additional change Paul will be asking of the trustees in the MOU is to item nine per Kathy's request about that additional sentence regarding bans and share of bans, number one. And number two, the motion that's on the floor is to postpone to December 18th. So I'd like to ask Paul if he believes that he can have an answer by December 18th. Paul? Yes, I believe I can have an answer by December 18th. Um, I also have a request for a chart that reiterates the numbers and also a clarification on um, who pays for the fundraising, whether that's part of an MOU or not. So there's a, there's a question, but I was the one made sure I, ca I captured everything counselors had identified. And Pam? Yeah, and the next item was that in number nine, it would also say expediting will not increase the library share. Right. Thank you. So the way that, so are we saying therefore that the way that we're asking the trustees to participate is in fact the way that we've already stated and that is they would expedite their payments. I just wanna, if what we're saying is the trustees by expediting their payments will not pay any more but will reduce what we have to borrow and therefore the amount and the length of the interest we have to pay. Is that what we're saying? That's, a, I believe that's what nine already says. Huh? That's what nine says. It basically says the trustees don't have to pay anymore, but we ask them to try to expedite their payments 
so that, and by the way, we will in fact, working with our legislators, go to MBLC and say, by any chance, could you give us a little more money sooner? And in the process, that reduces what we have to borrow, thus reducing the interest. Is that what our goal is? Because I'm trying to say, if that's the goal, I believe that's what this MOU already says. But what if people are looking for the trustees to actually pay more toward the interest on the bands, then that's a different question. I see a bunch of hands up. Pam? Alicia? Um, I wasn't going to answer the question you just posed, so I was just waiting to see if someone else wanted to respond directly to you. Okay, Jennifer? Yeah, I think I just want to, I hope I'm right, clarify maybe what Pam was saying and just that if the bid were to come back, let's say at 47, um, you would have to come back to the council. And I think there's some concern that, well, it's just a million more, so we're not going to forego the project for that. So if just some clarity that what if if the bids come in higher and it comes here and the council were to approve it, it's on the understanding that that share would be, you know, the live be added on to the library's responsibility to to. I think that's just if I'm interpreting it right, that that's, you know, there's a concern that it, you know, keeps creeping up by a million dollars here and there that 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 may happen, hopefully not. I mean, but that it would just we wouldn't have to then have another conversation about whether the town should take that on okay. since, you know, we all made a commitment, most of us, that we wouldn't commit the town. What to I think we have been year. very clear about is that if this bid and the one that we are ready to sign because the library has absolutely hit rock bottom and been able to make no other cuts. If it's $1 more, it has to come back to the council to increase. Okay. I'm now ready to make another statement, but I'm gonna to go to Kathy next. Kathy? Okay, to the extent I can, I think the concern, Lynn, I think it's totally clear they'd have to come back. We, I've been very grateful that the library says your share is still 15.8, which is when they came and said, oh my goodness, the costs are, are 10 million higher. Um, and they went out and said, we can raise the money. It's a long-term commitment to do the same, but I'm hoping this does it, that this 46 million, I, I did look at the numbers. Um, in terms of the most recent estimates, and there's still a healthy contingency fee in there. Um, there's a buffer to, if the basic estimates are somewhat off, there's there's some movement under the 46. So I think we're on pretty good financial ground, which is not what I thought in 2021. I thought the total cost was underestimated by a lot. So my, my point on the interest, and I understand what you're looking at, there's another clause in nine that says this will not increase the library share of the project. I do think if the library had to come in to help us to lower that, that interest cost might increase their payments for the project. And we've got this funny distinction between share and total payments. Um, you know, the library, you know, so if the library had to take out a loan to close the gap, they would be paying interest on the loan also. You know, so yes, they just owe us five million, but they're now all gonna, gonna owe the bank some. So it's trying to say if they can't expedite, and this is clearly, Paul, I, I know this is kind of messy wording, but you know, as needed, you know, if they can really expedite the funds and lower that cost substantially, then there's no need to share the interest costs. Suppose the best estimates that they gave us, this 2 million and then another 4 million turns out to be 2 million and another 2 million. So we've got to go out for higher bands. I mean, we're, we're everyone's doing their best to say that we think these are good numbers. So 
I just want to shift a little bit more risk over to the library. And I don't care about the specific words. That would be the intent. So I think if we're postponing it just for nine, um, I will commit to I don't have another request. I'll be ready to vote without a discussion on the next time we meet for a vote. I won't need to give an impassioned speech one way or the other. Anna. So my concern with what Jennifer and, and Pam were sharing was that I, I worry that it almost sounds as if we're trying to bind the hands of a future council. And I think that that's where, if, if that discussion, no matter what, has to come back to the council that it has to come back to, and likely that won't happen in this term. So I, I worry that setting that, putting that sort of language in there with the understanding that what we mean is that anything else the trustees have to raise is limiting the the right of that council to decide that. And while I agree with you that that's what should happen, that the trustees should be responsible, ultimately, I don't think that we can make that decision on an unknown like that. So I think that's my that's my issue with putting it in there is saying is that, that I think it binds it binds the hand of saying if if this decision comes back, if we have to create a new MOU, this is what we insist that it be. Um, I worry about that, not giving the right to that council that they have in making that decision. But I also don't believe that it would happen, that okay. it's going to come back. Alicia, do you want to go now? Um, yes, thank you, Lynn. I just wanted to say, and I think uh, Mr. Bachelman did catch this, but in response to Mandy's summary that I did also want to see an indication of who's responsible for capital um, for the campaign expenses. And I would like the cash flow to be added as a schedule um, to the MOA in addition. Okay. Uh, Pam. Yeah, in response to Anna's comment, I I I would be one of the people signing for a, an authorization. So I need to have the assurance for myself, not for the future council, but for myself that I'm comfortable with any of those conditions. And I, you know, that's that's sort it's that's the bottom line. Okay. Shalini. Um so again, I totally hear what you're saying, Pam. Uh, that and, and Je Jennifer also that you absolutely do not want to ever confront that situation where we have to or you all will have to increase the amount. Um, but there is a natural mechanism right now that you have we have all understood that is not going to impose a higher amount on the council on the town. And the and the addition of that language is only going to make our situation weaker. So the advent, because of the bidding, because it increases the amount that the bidders can bid. Yes, that we've been told that uh, in terms of, like, yeah, because that is the reason why, I mean, not 100%, but it is increasing the probability of giving um, a message to bidders that there is flexibility. And that's why we want an exact amount. If it goes above, there is a natural mechanism that will bring it back to town. And you can absolutely say no at that point. But putting it now, the the flexibility of a higher amount is, is making our situation worse. So I don't see the, the pros and cons of, it doesn't make sense to me to add that. Pam, I'm going to go back to you, but then I'm going on to Dorothy and this, to I mean, to I had to... we've already talked. I responded the same thing to Mandy, who brought up the same point. I'm comfortable that the town manager is going to, in some shape or form, identify that that any extra anything anything will be paid by the trustees if it comes up in the future, and I and I will trust him to. Please talk into the mic. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah. I just knew your, I, I your voice my, dropped. I lifted my finger too soon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Wait, I, so uh, I, I don't think we need to discuss that point anymore. I've, I've. Okay. I had one other point. Challenge. I had a qu question for Alicia. When you asked, you would like to see who's responsible for the campaign um, fundraising. 
did you mean a list of the people who are involved in the campaign? I mean, I'm not sure what no. you're asking. I, I the assume expenses? she meant which party, the library trustees or the town. And by the way, it is already on the spreadsheet in yeah, attachment it is. A. It is the trustees. I'm just asking. Is so it that okay we... if I respond? Yes, please, Alicia. Yeah, no, yeah I just want to see in the MOA an indication of who is responsible for the campaign expenses. And and you don't mean the individuals, you mean the the body, the actual yeah, organization. Yeah, and I would just like that explicitly stated. Okay, thank you. Dorothy? Well, you know, when we sign a contract, it's a future statement. So was, were those comments, questions from Anna to say that the town council cannot sign any contracts? Because when we when we said we we make these plans that go on for years, they're their future payments. And you know, so I guess I'm going to ask a question, which is, is it then true that any contract that the town of the Amherst Town Council signs and agrees on, votes on, um, is in fact something that can be changed at any time the council wants to meet and vote differently? Can I respond since Please. that's a question? No, Dorothy, of course not. We sign contracts all the time. Um, what my concern was, was when Pam indicated her initial comment, the way it was phrased, the way I understood it, is that she said, if this comes back, at which point an entirely new MOU would be brought forward, she wanted that MOU to specify something. And that was the only way she was comfortable agreeing to this MOU. Mm -hmm. I believe that that is changed. That's not saying this contract would be shifted because it it's basically writing a, a contract that doesn't exist yet. That was my issue with it. Well, we are, but you, can, you can write this contract with words that just say the library shall bear the costs. That could be stated in this that contract. Is what it, Dorothy, that is I what do. it says. It just specifies the amount. I'm not comfortable saying if the costs go over, in which case an entirely new MOU has to be drafted and has to be voted on by the council. I'm not comfortable specifying what should be in a non-existent future MOU. Oh, okay. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I got I got your point. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Pat, you've had your hand up for a while, please. I, I've heard quotes, uh, we are on good financial ground. We've been looking at this for the last five years. We had an incredible financial director lead in we had an incredible finance director who really showed us what we would be able to do um i'm very confused by the fear that i'm hearing uh that and i'm because i really don't understand it particularly when there are materials in the packet and in finance committee meetings that address the issues that are are supposedly not being addressed we, we need to make a decision one way or the other about funding our share of the library, and that involves us in this changing authorization. It becomes, you know, I, I have such great respect for Kathy's financial um, understanding and ideas, and she just got comfortable. So, um, you know, um, I want us to move forward because I have a feeling that come December 18, a very similar kind of thing is going to happen where we're going to nibble away and nibble away and nibble away. I think we need to make a decision. Uh, and I really, I encourage you to let go of fear or confusion <laughs> and, and not in a hippy dippy way, but to, to really look at what's been done and look at where we are and look at the flexibility that the trustees have shown and the responsibility that they have taken and how they're paying their own campaign costs. So if they want to spend a whole bunch of money to earn, you know, to generate more money, who's to blame them? It's their money. It's not costing the town anything. So how can we move forward really and truly? I know the decision I want it to be, but at this point, any decision would be better than none and the nibble and the nibble and the nibble.
Elite, uh, Michelle, you haven't spoken in a while. I just would like to dis to respectfully disagree. I don't think we'll come back on the 18th and nibble and nibble more. I think people have been very explicit that if certain things are um, taken into you know consideration and negotiated by the town manager, um, that we'll be able to move forward on the 18th. I do understand, uh, Pat, where you're coming from, of course, and seeing that we can certainly do that as a council, but I have confidence um, that we would be prepared to advance this on the 18th positively based on what I have observed. If uh, the town manager um, is is able to negotiate these additional requests, and um, can we call the question on on a <laughs> on a? Um... If you call the question, the question has been called. Have you called? Okay. The I do still see Shalini's hand up, so I don't want to. I, I I'm just <laughs> wondering if we're ready to to move forward with the vote here on postponing. Wait, the question's been called. I need a second. Second, Rooney. Okay. The question on the table at this point is to postpone to, is, am I correct? There's a motion to, the motion Michelle, was... did you make a motion for the previous question? Yes. I, I don't see any more hands up, so we don't have to waste our time on that necessarily, but. I'm so ready. if there was not a motion, the motion on the floor is to postpone the vote to December 18, 2023. That's correct. And that's the motion we're voting on. Although the first thing we have to do is call the question. No, no we don't have to vote. Michelle didn't Thank make you. a motion. I, I'm sorry. Thank you. All right. We're going to move then to the question that's on the floor. The question on the floor is whether to, or not to postpone the vote on the motion to authorize the borrowing to December 18th, okay? That is the question on the floor, okay? Anna, you have a question. Could Paul please articulate to us very clearly what he intends to bring as changes to the MOU to the library trustees because we've had a lot of discussion. Thank you for that question. Paul? <clears throat> So the things I have, um, and again, they only approve this in principle, so they may have wording changes that they would like to see. So I want to be clear that this is not in principle. They understood that this is what we put in front of them. They have not come back to me with changes that they would like to see, and I know they will have changes. Just they have a, they're a separately elected body that has authority to represent the trustee, the trust, the library. So the things I have are um, to. Um, Put in who if put in possibly a put in a chart that shows um, the borrowing thing in a chart format as, as, in addition to the words that are there. Um, add the cash flow that we had that we've been talking about. We all know that cash flow is a planning document. It doesn't commit anybody to anything because interest rates change, things change, but it lays out what we have been talking about. It's in a, in the council packet anyway. Uh, Clarification in this about who, what side of the ledger the uh, fundraising expenses are on. Uh, is it on the t library side or on the town side? Um, on item nine, um, that stating in the last sentence that expediting payments does not increase the new library share of the project, um, and that um, additional bands. They will, the um, library will try attempt, I don't have the exact language, I'll have to get it from Kathy. If they're able to, they will do more. Um, I think those are the things. Is there anybody that sees additional changes? Jennifer? No, I had a comment, but I'll make it after. This is not an answer to your question. Okay. Are there any other, any other suggestions for additions to this MOU? All right, so the question on the floor is whether we're postponing until the 18th. Jennifer? I guess I, I just wanted to um, kind of echo what Michelle, and I think Alicia, and Kathy said, is we are trying to get to a point of, we're not just trying to be difficult, we just want to get to a point that we're all, this is really important, it's a lot of money, and I think we're just trying to get to the point that we can move forward 
in a positive way. I just okay. Any other questions or comments? So we're going to move to a roll call vote on whether we're postponing to the 18th. And with that, I'm going to start with Anna. No. Hold on just one second. Okay. Anna is a no. Uh, uh, Greasemer is an aye. Haneke? Aye. Anika Lopes? No. Michelle Miller? Aye. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Alicia Walker? Yes. Shalini Balmilm? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? No. Anna, and I, we already did that. Okay, so it's 10 in favor and three opposed. So the motion passes. We will be taking this up again on the 18th. Um, we may have a break. <laughs> yes, we huh. will return at 9 40.
Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to reconvene all people of the council. Okay. Please take the sign down so I can see as people come back. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to um, solar now. Uh huh. Okay. We are. say to you is council <laughs> let's go gang stephanie uh Dwayne, and chris you're up next i promise you Hey, Chris, I only underestimated by an hour and 45 minutes, right? Oh, he didn't pass it. As soon as you return, please turn your camera on so I know that you're back. Okay, Pat, you're here. Uh, Anna, you're here. Anika, you're here. Uh, Shalini, are you back? Michelle, you're here. Alicia, are you back? Yes, I am. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you so much for answering, Alicia. Uh, Dorothy, you are back. Okay, we're going to get going. Um, the next item on our agenda is the solar bylaw. Uh, and I want to just begin by saying we are not passing a solar bylaw tonight. All we are doing tonight is referring it for further development. We're not even referring it for hearing. We're just referring it for further development to CRC, and then it will go on their carryover memo, okay? So we, in a moment, we're going to recognize Planning Director Chris Brestrup, Director of Sustainability Stephanie Ciccarella, and Dwayne Brigger, who is the chair of the Solar Bylaw Working Group, but before I do that, I will also want to recognize and thank the Solar Bylaw Working Group uh, members, Janet McGowan, Laura Pagliarulo, Pagliarulo, 
um, Jim Jack Jemsick, Robert Brooks, Daniel Corcoran, and Martha Hanner, who is vice chair. Some of them are in the audience uh, listening, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Chris and the rest of your group. Good evening. My name is Chris Brestrup, and I'm the planning director. And I think Stephanie was going to give an introduction to our uh, session here. And then Dwayne is going to speak, and I'll be the last one to speak. So um, if you'll recognize Stephanie, that would be Please. great. Go right ahead, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Lynn, and thank you all. Um, we will be, um, I believe, decidedly brief <laughs> this evening. So I just wanted to point out for members of the council as well as members of the public who may be viewing that in your packet we had a memo to the town manager that was from Dwayne Bregger, Chris Brestrip, and myself that was an overview of the process and the deliverables of the Solar Bylaw Working Group. And in that memo, we identified the three deliverables, one of which was a map-based solar assessment, and the second, a community uh, preference assessment were two items that were uh, developed in conjunction with GZA and Geo Environmental. The town engaged the consultant services to develop these two pieces of information. Adrian Dunk of GZA Geo Environmental served as the project manager along with myself for the town. Um, those two were actually delivered to the council previously, but they are included in this memo uh, to be identified as pieces that were part of the charge. They're highlighted in the memo for easy identification and access. The links are in the memo. So I do encourage you, if you haven't previously looked at them, to please go back and take a look at those two items. Uh, the third is the draft of the solar bylaw itself. Um, Chris Brestrip will be referencing uh, this particular item in her comments. And attached to that is a classification standards chart, which is part of the draft solar bylaw. So I just wanna make sure that you identify those two pieces go together. Um, and with that, I will say that the uh, solar bylaw working group convened on June 22nd of 2022, and their last meeting was November 9th of 2023. Uh, we did have an extension that was granted, actually several extensions that were granted by the town manager in order to cover some of the more difficult and challenging aspects of uh, the bylaws development. So with that, I will turn things over to Dwayne Breger, who served as the chair of the Solar Bylaw Working Group. Dwayne. Great. Hello, uh, thank you. Uh, Lynn, okay? Yes, please go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you, uh, Stephanie, for that introduction and, and uh, town council for uh, the opportunity to deliver and present the solar bylaw uh, draft to, to you for referral. Um, I did want to personally also acknowledge and thank the members of the solar bylaw working group. Uh, and Lynn, I, I, I'll repeat some, some of those names as well, just to uh, clarify a little bit as well, that um, uh, we did have seven voting members, uh, including uh, particular committees. Um, so Janet McGowan, uh, was representing the planning board, myself uh, representing the Energy and Climate Action Committee, Laura Pagliarulo uh, representing the Conservation Commission, and Jack Jemsick representing the Water Supply Protection Committee. Uh, the other three members, Martha Hanner, Robert Brooks, and uh, Daniel uh, Corcoran were um, appointed um, unaffiliated residents as appointed by the town manager. Um, in addition, I'll just uh, add that we worked very hard. We did meet essentially bi-weekly every other week uh, for the duration uh, uh, throughout the, the time period. Uh, part of the reasons for the extension was um, to um, schedule time with the uh, town council, uh, um, uh, legal council, uh, as well as uh, experts from various different uh, areas involved with solar, with this, with the solar bylaw and solar siting, uh, that um, brought a lot of color to the um, to our conversations and and details to our conversations. Um, and um, um, with that, let me turn it. And let me let me also uh, thank the committee, but also uh, dearly thank uh, the the work and 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 uh, um, support from uh, town planner Christine. Uh, Brestrip and uh, and Director of Sustainability Stephanie uh, for their hard work and and work with the work with the working bylaw 
uh, solar bylaw working group uh, throughout the duration. And with that, let me turn over to Christine, uh, and she can give us some uh, um, overview of the bylaw itself. Good evening. I'm Chris Brester, Planning Director. And um, after meeting for about a year and a half and reviewing and discussing drafts of the Solar Bylaw, the Solar Bylaw Working Group voted on November 9th, 2023, to recommend the draft Solar Bylaw uh, as presented to you this evening. This draft represents a lot of work by the working group and town staff researching how other towns in Massachusetts regulate large solar installations. We also consulted model solar bylaws prepared by the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, the Cape Cod Commission, and the Mass DOER, or Department of Energy Resources. And we were mindful of the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 40A, Section 3, part of which states that no zoning ordinance or bylaw shall prohibit or unreasonably regulate the installation of solar energy systems or the building of structures that facilitate the collection of solar energy, except where necessary to protect the public health, safety, or welfare. So the uh, <clears throat> working group tackled a lot of topics, but among those topics, uh, they spent a lot of time thinking about and discussing two relatively controversial topics. One of them was how to regulate large scale solar installations on, uh, proposed on farmland. And the other one was how to regulate uh, proposed installations in forested areas. For farmland, the, the working group decided to require that agrivoltaics be used for installations in farmland um, that are over five acres in size. Ag agrivoltaics is a form of dual use where a portion of the property is used for farming and a portion of the property is used for solar arrays. This usually occurs in alternating rows of agriculture and solar panels. The technology is not yet mature and is currently being studied and developed. Therefore, the working group did not want to impose such a, a requirement without providing an alternative. So the working group decided to provide a mechanism by which an applicant could prove to the permit granting authority um, in a special case that agrivoltaics was not technically or financially feasible for a certain installation. This would require hiring an expert consultant to make this argument to the permit granting authority. Um, for forests, after much discussion and vote, the working group decided not to limit the amount of forest land that could be cut for solar installation. And, and did not require mitigation for forest land that was cut for solar installation. They were dissuaded from imposing such a limitation because these limitations are not imposed on other types of development, such as housing and commercial development. And such a limitation on solar may discourage the installation of solar and encourage the construction of other types of development. And they didn't think that was fair. However, the Solar Bylaw Working Group did decide to encourage Town Council to consider adopting a limitation on forest cutting in the future that could be applied to all types of development. So the draft that we're presenting tonight is the work of the Solar Bylaw Working Group. However, it has not been reviewed by, it has not been thoroughly reviewed by the Building Commissioner, the Wetlands Administrator, the Fire Department, the Sustainability Director, or the Town Attorney, KP Law. KP Law has provided advice and answers to specific questions as the draft was being developed, but it hasn't had an opportunity to review and make recommendations on the bylaw as a whole. And generally speaking, when the planning department is developing a bylaw, we do engage with KP Law all along the way to try to make sure that what we come up with in the end is um, a, a, a good document. So therefore, we and the town manager are recommending that town council refer this draft solar bylaw to the community resources committee for further development. And the planning department staff would be pleased to support the CRC in this endeavor and bring back a thoroughly vetted, reviewed and developed solar bylaw for your consideration in the spring. Please let us know if you have any questions on the materials that we have submitted. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to place the motion on the floor. And the motion is to refer the so draft solar bylaw 
to the Community Resources Committee for further development with a report and recommendation to the Town Council by June 30th, 2024. Is there a second? Steinberg seconds. So I wanna just make two notes about the motion. First of all, it's a referral, but not for hearing. This is not ready for prime time. The second is that the June 30th deadline is basically to say, make sure you come back and let us know. At that point, CRC may be able to actually say, we think this is ready for review, for hearing, but it has to come back to the council for that hearing. So with that, are there any comments or questions? Anna. I have one question, one comment. Um, so my question first is in reading through this, it, it's very thorough in terms of the, the regulations that it's placing on the large scale ground mount installations. I'm curious, one of the things that I'm really hoping for is how we can, at the same time as we regulate, also encourage uh, responsible development where we should be putting responsible development. And I think that that's something that I'm not necessarily seeing. And I recognize that that is a harder and more abstract thing to get at in a bylaw. Um, but I'm curious in your conversations, how you plan to incorporate that um, I don't know if incentivization is the right word, but how you plan to incorporate that encouragement um, for for other siting uh, on non-forested or non-farmland. And then my comment, so that's point one. My comment is um, in the motion to refer, can we include the review from the relevant town departments that were mentioned, or can we get a some other sort of guarantee that CRC will be in consultation with, uh, I believe it was planning, conservation, fire department, and a legal review? I guess that was a question after all. Yes. Um, Chris, uh, I, I think at this point, I just wanna make sure that people understand what we're talking about now is what is it we are saying as we refer this to CRC? We're not expecting the uh, committee to come back with all of these answers, but Chris, please go ahead. So generally speaking, a zoning bylaw is um, a regulatory mechanism. It isn't a mechanism to encourage things to happen. I think there are very um, you know, strong and, and good bodies and individuals in town who can help to encourage um, solar development. What we tried to do was create a solar bylaw that didn't discourage um, solar development because we think it's very important. And we do uh, refer to several documents and um, declarations that the town has already put together or made um, to uh, encourage solar development in order to reduce greenhouse gases. So I guess that's that's what I would, um, that's how I would answer Anna. Thank you. But Anna, you had a separate separate part, and that was Chris listed a number of um, departments and uh, our law firm that have not done reviews, and you're asking whether those could root reviews could be done before CRC takes this up. Is that what, is that? Am I hearing you? No, I, I want it as part of the. I, I want to know that by the time it comes back to the council, that those groups have been consulted. Okay. Okay. And CRC can deem at what point in the process they want them to be consulted, consulted. But I believe that those, I, I apologize, Chris, I was trying to write down and I missed some, but um, the groups that she named, I would like them to be part of that uh, consultation process at some point. Okay. Do you feel like you need to amend the motion or do you think that CRC as a body would receive that information? Uh, if the chair of CRC could confirm that it will be in the carryover memo as part of the as part of this, that would be fine. I'd be fine with not amending the motion. I can add it to the carryover memo. Thank you. <laughs> Taking care of. Okay. Dwayne, you had your hand up. Yeah, just to add to um, Anna's comment, uh, do keep in mind the, the solar bylaw um, draft is purposefully uh, limited and the charge was to limit it to large scale solar development. So um, we define that as 25, 250 kilowatts and above about an, an acre or more. Um, uh, so this doesn't um, refer to or, or, or deal with uh, more uh, solar on the built environment, uh, if, if you will. Uh, certainly there is interest within the working group, but also I would refer to the uh, um, Energy Climate and Action Commit Committee 
uh, work in that group to uh, work on more proactive uh, opportunities and incent not incentives, but programs to try to encourage um, solar development on the built environment in, in the town. Great, thanks, Chris and Dwayne. Thank okay. you. Um, Pat? Thank you. I have a, a couple of questions. Um, in some of the material, it said the town of Amherst has established requirements regarding the insta installation of large scale ground mounted photovoltaic installations. And I want to know where those are because I tried to find them. So, and I also noticed that there were a great many links, which were very helpful uh, in terms of farmland and soil and uh, stormwater management. And I guess I was wondering why there aren't some active links to forests uh, and the role they play in sequestration and possibly managing them. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of interested in being able to pick your brain about where some of these things are. Um, I also want to thank the group for working um, on this. Um, and uh, it'll be uh, it'll be a challenge to take up, so thank you. But I would like an answer about where the established requirements are. Okay, Chris, we'll just ask if you could send something uh, to reply to that. I will be happy to do that, yes. Okay, uh, Mandy Jo. Um. A, a couple of questions to think about before and this necessarily comes to CRC for further discussion. Um, it was an interesting read to me. Um, one of the things, and, and I'll just go through some very general stuff right now. Um, this bylaw indicated that it is not regulating solar canopies, canopies on parking lots. Um, what does regulate solar canopies and why is this choosing not to, I guess is one question and it doesn't need answered now, but but to think about. Um, and one of the other, you know, uh, and then another one was, I, I saw a lot of requirements in here that didn't necessarily deal with site design. Typical things that I think of is zoning things like dimensional setbacks, things like that. Um, for example, um, the removal of a development, um, annual reports of income or the activities on the property. Um, in, it, it wasn't necessarily income, but it was generation capacity on an annual basis needed to be reported to the permit granting authority, certifying compliance on an annual basis with the special permit, um, reports ongoing reports, it sounded like, or inspections after storms. Um, there was one in here about um, certifying that you're going to do ways to improve crop yields to the permit granting authority and mandating that crop yields would need to be improved of some sort. Um, there's a lot of things like that that struck me as different from typical zoning regulations. And so I'm curious, and one of the questions if I'm on CRC in the next term I would have is how much of these sort of types of requirements are found in other, in the zoning bylaw for other types of developments when we're developing, you know, a retail space or an office park space or a, you know, a um, research and development space. Do we require the R&D space to report out its compliance every year with the special permit and things like that. Um, or when we permit farmland, if we do, um, or buildings on farmland, do we require reporting out of that? Because um, it, it seemed like there was a lot of that in here that I haven't seen in other zoning bylaws. So those are some things to, to think about as we move forward. Thank you. Okay, are there any other comments? I, for some reason, don't seem to be able to raise my hand without going to my phone. Okay, there I did it. Okay, thanks. I don't know why all of a sudden that happened. Um, I have a couple things uh, that have been mentioned. I just want to emphasize that I would like to make sure that CRC pays close attention to. 
You've already mentioned protection of farmlands and forests. I want to add to that water prote water source protection uh, because while many people in town are on sewers, 5% of the town is actually on um, uh, wells and many of those are near forested areas, which is often where we want to place these uh, as well. And the other one for me is the growing alarm I have over battery storage and the safety of battery storage. It's um, seeing more and more fires and the extent to which we would be putting our entire town at risk because a fire starts near a forest because of a battery. Uh, so those issues are paramount in my mind, frankly, as we look at some other solar installations in town. Thank you. Mandy Jo? You reminded me of my other question that I had related to this, which was in the battery storage section, there was a sentence that said the town of Amherst is working on a bylaw to regulate battery, battery energy storage systems. And I guess my question is, we are? Um, and, right. and, and and are we? And, and who is? And, and where is that getting discussed? Um, Okay, so Chris, did you want to jump into that? Sure. Or? Yeah. Um. So it was not um, clear to us from the beginning whether we were supposed to come up with a battery storage bylaw, and so I think um, for various reasons we didn't come up with a battery storage bylaw until quite close to the end. And by the time we drafted it, there wasn't enough time for the working group to. Um, review it carefully. So it does exist. And if the CRC would like to take that up along with the solar bylaw, I would think that would be a really great idea. So I would be happy to work with CRC on that if that would uh, be something you'd like to work on. Thank you. Um, so seeing no other, no other hands, uh, again, this is to refer to CRC for further development uh, and it will go on the carryover memo. Okay, I'm gonna start with the vote. Uh, I guess it's me, I. Mandy Johanneke. Do I, oh, do I'm we sorry. want to amend to, include, to add the uh, battery storage bylaw to the referral? Um, uh, yeah, sure. So to refer the draft solar bylaw, the only problem is we don't have it in our packet. We've never seen it. So I would suggest it could go in the 18th and we could refer it then. Okay, thank you. Good point though. We're gonna move on to the vote. So Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Jo? Aye. Anika Lopes? Aye. Michelle Miller? Aye. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Pam Rooney? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Alicia Walker? Yes. Shani Balmilne? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothian? Aye. Okay. Thank you. And I again, I just want to thank the solar working, the solar bylaw working group for all of the work you have done and recognize the complicated nature of this. I believe that during this discussion, at least two other potential bylaws have been brought up. So thank you. Um, the next uh, is about... A quick point of order, Lynn. Yes. You, you had mentioned that we would put a draft bylaw on the next agenda. For battery storage? Yes, draft bylaw for we battery need to storage. Need a bylaw in the form necessary for adoption for an introduction? It would be for further development. I We're not going to do it for hearing. Um, the planning director just indicated it exists. So It exists, okay. Yeah. So she, she may be able to supply you with appropriate. I, okay. think, it, I think what we want to do is probably refer to CRC for review possible further development before referred back to the council. That's fine, we just need something. Yeah, that's why we couldn't act on it tonight. Um, okay, the next is regarding the rental registration bylaw and Michelle, you have your hand up. Yeah, not not for that per se, but um, I just looked at the agenda and it looks like it's maybe 
two more hours it could be. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering if there's uh, some 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 items that might be able to get moved to next week or uh, if you have thought about that at all, Lynn, because it's already. I have, been... but let me do this one and then look at okay. what else. Okay. That sounds great. Yeah. Thank you. Kathy, you have your hand up. Yes. We're on the rental permit bylaw, correct? Yes, we are. Yeah. Sorry. I couldn't get my hand up. Um, I'd like to do a motion to postpone um, until uh, the, uh, January and it, uh, specifically, the wording we're pursuant to Council Rule Procedure 7.1, I move to postpone the discussion of the proposed rental permit bylaw and regulations on until January 8th. So it's to a date certain. And the reason I'm doing that is because oh, of can I Can I speak a second agenda. first and then come back? Okay, second. Second, Rooney. Okay, now go Okay, ahead. and so the, the reason for this is what Michelle just mentioned. Um, Looking at the agenda yesterday, I said, we're just not gonna have time for a full discussion of this. And I had a few amendments that were both languages and fees, and there's some other concerns. So I, I think because of the significance of this change, we need to make sure we have enough time on an agenda. And I'm looking to uh, Lynn who said, there should be ample time on the January 8th agenda to not short circuit the time for discussion for this. So that is, this isn't to delay it as much as to make sure we have time. And, and just so uh, those who aren't on finance know, um, during the finance discussion, I was working with potential fee changes. And I also wanted to talk about frequency of inspection changes, but uh, there, we were restricted to only looking at the financial aspects and fees. So I had other comments. So this would also allow a fuller discussion and potentially changes because I can send some of those to CRC that would address it. Um, and everyone's seen the ads in the newspaper recently. I think to the extent we can on the 8th, we should also have an executive session and bring in legal counsel so we can have a full discussion of privacy concerns um, that address to extent their potential risks of litigation. So this would also allow time to arrange for that. And that's the reason I'm mo for my motion to postpone. Okay, the motion has been made in second to postpone. We really should stick to the discussion of the motion. Shalini? Um. I was going to say that, um, you know, in CRC, we did try to have a process where we were inviting comments and we were inviting different stakeholders to speak. Uh, however, I don't think the CRC had a chance to debrief the, the large number of emails we've received. And so I'm in support of Kathy's motion, but also I was wondering if, if, we, <clears throat> if there was a way for CRC to also put it on the agenda to see how to move forward and to create a space to hear the different stakeholders that we're hearing from now. Um, and then the other thing I was thinking was that I feel like the finance committee has been working and I know Mandy Joe has been attending those meetings, but right. But I, I do feel that there were so many reasons why different things were put in place. And also maybe, I don't know if that's an option for the finance committee to work with CRC and have a joint discussion around that. But before that also, um, I really do feel that uh, this is such a complex issue and it affects the livelihood of many people and it might have impact on um, tenants and increasing costs, especially to single family homes. And um, so it has just has so many implications that we are hearing about now that it would make sense to give CRC a chance to uh, sort of decide what they want to do with all this information that we've received. Okay. The motion on the table is to refer to a council meeting on uh, January 8th. I just want to clarify that I have no idea what the, what the meeting looks like for January 8th. 
Uh, that's not my responsibility at this point. Uh, and but I do I did confer with Kathy and already determined that trying to do this on the 18th was out of the question. So eighth is the motion that's on the table. So let me suggest the following process in response to um, Shalini's um, question, and that is it could be determined on January 8th that based on discussion among the council and with legal counsel, that we would then refer it back to CRC. And at that point, they would do that. But given the timing of the end of this council's term and the limited time council uh, committees have to meet, I don't see how we would expect that to happen between now and January 2nd. So the motion is to refer, is to postpone until January 8th. That motion's been made and seconded. Are there any other comments? Okay, seeing, yes, Mandy Jo. Those extra button clicks take more time to I, raise your do, hand. Don't they? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I guess as chair of CRC, I'm looking for clarification because both Shalini and Kathy indicated there may be desire for CRC. Kathy, in her explanation of her motion, mm -hmm. flat out, I think, stated that she was going to send stuff and hope CRC would talk about mm -hmm. it before January 8th. So I'm looking for clarification of as chair, is this something I need to be putting on an agenda for potential discussion at CRC? Is is Kathy, is Shalini, are people expecting potential amendments again to this document prior to January 8th? Kathy? Um I don't, I didn't anticipate that, Mandy, given that we're on December 4th, I would be happy and I've written them out a bit more fully now that I'm free from looking just at fees, but I've gone through the fee schedule again and trying to limit the cost impact and timing impact on, um, we, we had such a, a one person who sent us a comment um, and I would like to avoid that, that we wouldn't want to send a fire engine out to everyone's house on the anticipation it might be on a fire. We would really like to focus it. So she, it was a quip, but it was, let's try to think of, can we focus and target it a bit better? So I have some ideas for that. And I didn't think we had time tonight, but I'd be happy to write them up, but I wouldn't expect CRC to have to address them. I, I think it, this is the time for 13 of us to try to say, how much we love, what we don't, and then to do revisions. But I I think not all of us have had a chance to do that. And I didn't come to all of your meetings early on. I was sending periodic comments as this was evolving. So I didn't think between now and the 8th, CRC would meet to address a series of changes. I think that's asking too much because a lot of people may have things that they want to address. So I hope that answers it. I'm I'm happy to compile them. Mandy Joe, does that answer your question? Okay. Andy. Yeah, no, I may not need to say much now. I was going to uh, um, make a statement in support of the motion because uh, I too had thought on a different topic of an amendment that could be offered and considered since it was now um, in second reading and it belonged to the council and not the committee anymore, it was up to the council one to decide whether to refer it back to the committee. But uh, I think that I was uh, uh, recognizing that given the length of this meeting, that having a lengthy discussion about uh, several amendments that were proposed was gonna make this far too onerous for tonight. And uh, that's why I was supporting. So the motion is to refer it back to, re I'm sorry, the motion is to ref to to take it up on a date certain January 8th. At that time, upon taking it up, there may be a motion to refer it back to CRC. Mandy Jo, I want to make sure, I I want to respect both the chair and the rest of the members of CRC and hear from you about this at this point.
I guess what I'm hearing is people are going to just refer this back to CRC. And if that's going to be the case on January 8th, why are we not just doing that now? Okay. So um, the motion's on the floor, unless somebody wants to withdraw the motion, we'll vote on the motion and then somebody can do a different motion. Michelle? Yeah, I'm I'm with Mandy on this. I feel like okay. if there's uh, <clears throat> that we've received a lot of information through public comment and otherwise, and it seems like it would be appropriate for it to go back to CRC to have further discussion of how CRC would recommend addressing those concerns. Okay. I want to make sure that we're, if we're ready to vote this up or down and go on to another, but or what are we going to do? Huh? I'm sorry, what? I was saying, Pat was adding a comment and I was asking her to use her microphone because no one at home can hear okay, her. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, the motion could be withdrawn. Uh, Shalini? Yeah, I, I'm in support. I mean, I'm in support of it going back to CRC so that um, as part of the process that, you know, we have been making space to hear different people, but now that we've finally have the whole thing and people are getting a chance to look at it. And we've heard um, from one group of stakeholders for sure. And I think bringing, incorporating that and and uh, bringing everyone to the table is an important part of a process because this is a huge, huge changes we're making. So we just wanna make sure that we do here. And then we haven't act, act, actively heard from um, other stakeholders, maybe like tenants or neighbors. So like, I mean, there has to be a, I mean, what I'm, I mean, we're all sort of, this is still very new. We're still the second term of council. So I think even as we think of the process moving forward, I think it's important that we hear from people at different times in the process, not just in the beginning, but also once the bylaw is more evolved to again, get feedback from people. And so that, I mean, so I think it, all I'm saying is that I agree that it should go back to CRC. Thank you, Jennifer. Yes, and I agree with what Shalini also just said that there's, we've recently heard from one group of stakeholders and part of the bylaw is to, was that we took into, we incorporated in the summer of 2022 when we heard from all the stakeholders including the tenants, the renters, and that um, is also part of what, yes, we need to hear from those stakeholders again as well. Okay. Uh, Michelle, I'm going to skip to Andy for a moment since you've spoken. Andy? Yeah, no, I was just going to raise a question for uh, maybe from Andy as chair of the committee as to whether the committee is going to have the opportunity to work on it given the fact that we're going into a holiday period fairly soon. Uh, the thing that I'm also conscious of is that the building commissioner, Mr. Mora, has uh, advised that uh, it's important to bring closure to this as quickly as possible, if we can, so that it can be in place for the next registration year when the registrations are renewed. So when the uh, original motion was made by Kathy, there was a date certain, and I thought, well, if we're just going to con consider some amendments on the floor, that we would um, then have the possibility still of doing it uh, and getting a final vote in plenty of time for uh, implementation, as Mr. Mora had suggested for the next year. Uh, so I don't know if you have any comments as chair of the committee. CRC has one more meeting scheduled for this term before the end of the year. Um, I think it's up to this council to decide if it would be ready to vote on January 8th with or without CRC discussing this bylaw at that meeting, um, or whether a discussion in January 8th would likely result in a referral, because if it would likely result in a referral, waiting two and three weeks to make that referral doesn't necessarily make sense. 
um, because CRC could begin taking up that referral in a week with this council sending all of its questions, concerns, and potential amendments to the body, I'm mentioning them now or just sending them to me as chair so that I can compile them and stick them into a draft um, for discussion on the 18th. At this point in time, CRC likely has time to discuss it on the 18th. Whether it can finish its work, I don't know on the 18th, but it can at least begin that discussion if it's referred back. If it's not referred back and just postponed to the 8th, it does not start that discussion until committees are formed sometime in late January. Right. Correct. Pam? I would support referring it back to CRC as well so that it can go on to the carryover um, memo and there can be some of this detail included in that. And so whatever CRC that is formed in January has at least um, some record of, of what the intention is. Okay. Dorothy, I'm going to skip over Andy and go to you. Um, just to the point, I think it was Jennifer made it that um, in previous times you'd heard from renters, which certainly includes students. So we should not have, we should make sure there's an opportunity for students to participate um, if they choose in some kind of speaking. So that means not during the Christmas break. Okay, Jennifer, I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go back to Andy now. Yeah, I was just gonna say a seconder of the motion. It's up to the maker of the motion to make final decision on this, but I would uh, be quite willing to um, drop this motion if the maker of the motion wishes to and uh, do the referral to CRC because CRC can always make a recommendation to uh, or make a decision that it wants more time to bring it back to the council. And the right. council has the opportunity in January if it feels that it's still not had sufficient discussion opportunity within the council to delay it gives more control uh, to CRC on how to deal with it. Kathy, I'm going to skip. I'm going to skip over Jennifer and go to Kathy since you made the motion. Um, well, I'm a little surprised because um, I was trying to be somewhat protective. I'll be honest of myself um, because if CRC is going to take this up again. Um, rather than me do wording changes, I just need to come to the CRC meeting to talk through some of this. So it puts another meeting on my agenda, which I we have two finance committee meetings next week. We have two the week after that. I have a school building committee. So it it's, it's a lot of work. Um, so what I had hoped would happen is that we'd have a fuller discussion of everybody's concerns before it went back so that you were dealing with it. But if people would prefer to have CRC work on this on the 18th, I'll just join CRC. I'm, I, the intention was to allow time to get everybody's input. I'm sitting on the finance committee. I was told, don't deal with the regulations. You know, you're just supposed to focus on fees. So I did, <laughs> um, but I can focus on the gestalt at this point. And I've started reading some other cities and towns just to look at variations. So I realize you've done a lot of work. So it, it was to avoid the group that's been focused on this. Sometimes you get locked into a certain way of thinking to hear from everyone. But if no one else is gonna spend a lot of time on thinking through this, I'm happy to just try to come to the CRC meeting. Okay. Yeah, to attend it and, and to, pardon? So I can send, send it, but I would like to speak to it because it's not as simple of change this right. word, get rid of this clause. It's it's try to do the following things. So I I can re I can I guess rescind my motion to postpone and turn it into a refer to CRC that we're not doing it tonight. I thought it would be quicker just to postpone the discussion. Okay, so let me just clarify at this point. The person who has made the motion has rescinded it and the seconder has agreed to that. So is there a new motion? I move to refer uh, the red rental registration 
bylaw and regulations back to the CRC. Second, DeAngelis. Okay. And um, you'll keep us apprised as to when you want to bring it forward. Let me point out that the next CRC meeting is uh, December 14th at 4.30, correct, Mandy Jo? December 18th at 4.30. I think the, no, the 14th, no, sorry, 14th. the 14th yeah, is a Thursday. Is the 18th is the meeting. council meeting, right. the 14th right. at 4. And you'll be telling us on the 18th uh, how you're going to put on the carryover memo, memo at that time. So, uh, And Mandy Jo, when would you like anybody who wants to give you any feedback to get it to you? Um, by Friday, December 8th. That's this Friday, December 8th, close of business? Noon, so that Athena can post by Noon. close of business. Thank you. Okay. So you're all asked to provide feedback to the chair of CRC, Mandy Johanneke, by noon on this Friday, December 8th, uh, if we pass this motion. So now the motion is, and I need a second. There was a did, second. It was did Angela. I get a second? Yeah, I did, Pat. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions, Andy? No. Okay, Jennifer. I just didn't want to lose Kathy's suggestion that we, the council, might want to have executive session with legal counsel. Now, does that? I think we'll leave that to the issue of when um, after CRC looks at it, because they may actually want to do that, and we have to determine whether or not they can have an executive session. Uh, because of the restrictions of what executive sessions can be used for. Okay. If I may, huh? Paul has indicated to me that anticipation of litigation is not an eligible matter for Thank executive you. session, but Paul can probably better answer that. So I would look at the <clears throat> material we have and send it to our town attorney and get an official ruling on it. Okay. Um, yeah. So... So the motion on the floor now is to refer back to CRC and they will come back to the council with suggestions, recommendations, and so forth. Okay. Is there any question on the motion? I would just ask Athena if she can get me the direct language so that I can get it into transfer memos and everything for posting when sometime tomorrow. The direct language of this of motion. the motion. Sometime tomorrow. Just and all it's just to refer the rental registration bylaw and regulations back to the community resources committee but yeah, the, the um unofficial record will be posted tomorrow okay thank you okay all right we have to move to a vote mandy johanneke uh point of order did you want to include fees or no oh fees include were not fees. included in the motion yes. andy include fees Andy, you, your motion was to refer the bylaw and regulations. Did you want to include the fee schedule? I think at this point that I was not going to do so. I had been prepared to make a uh, about three sentence report on the uh, action of the uh, finance committee, so that it would just be clear to everybody. If, uh, I'll leave it to the president as to whether I should go ahead and do that. I. Are you asking me or I, my personal opinion is it should include the fees. Yes. Just send the fee schedule to have it. Be okay. A... Then uh, I'll add the fee schedule to the referral. Okay. Thank and you. Pat, you made the, you second. Okay. All right. So it's all the pieces, the bylaw, the regulations and the fees. Okay. Everybody ready to vote? Mandy Jo, here's your chance to say no. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mandy Jo. Aye. Anika. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. 
Yes. Shalini Baumilne. Yes. Patty Angelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. And Lynn Griesmer with unbelievable regret that we've had to do this to you. <laughs> it's unanimous. Okay. Uh, now let's talk about the agenda. Okay. We still have on the agenda the town manager evaluation with an executive session to follow. We still have on the agenda the town manager goals with a discussion by GOL. We still have on the agenda the draft financial guidelines, which is a discussion only, and the committee carryover discussion and referral of, oh, we, no, we voted on that, and then the calendar, and then the executive session. I'm open to suggestions as to what we think makes sense to delay to the 18th. Not all can be delayed. Okay. Michelle? I think we have to have the executive session, right? For sure. Yes. So I'm wondering, like, I, I mean, it's 1035. I think it's unreasonable to consider this meeting going on for much longer than this. Uh, maybe beyond 11. So I, I, that's my personal opinion. Maybe other people have different ideas about that, but I do want to ensure that we have the executive session as a priority if that's uh, if that's needed tonight. Okay. Mandy Joe. Given that the council does not have any information